one of the first orders of business resulting from her new position as security advisor to Senator Iskra was attending a charity event held by shipbuilding giant Kate Drive Yards. Ostensibly, the gala's purpose was to collect donations for refugees in the Gaulas sector, but the hosts kept extolling the virtues of technological superiority in protecting the civilians and minimizing casualties among the troops. Pure lobby work. As Iskra had explained, Zaya Thris' only goal was familiarizing herself with the networking tactics employed by the attending civil servants and industry representatives. For what purpose had remained unclear, but it was as good an opportunity as any to learn the ropes of politics in this new world. She fulfilled her thankless task, listened into inane conversations, small talk barely concealing ulterior motives, of which both parties seemed aware. A practiced little dance to get into each other's good graces performed by an army of influence-hungry sycophants that would have given Sarish a run for her money. The hypocrisy of the Republic was astounding. The fates of billions decided over drinks and giggles by imbeciles clad in ridiculously ugly garments, which apparently passed for high fashion. Building a power base was one thing, but there was no mechanism for pruning the ranks of those in power. Besides, this was not power at all. This was just senseless decadence. Democracy worked exceptionally well, if the intention was to promote the most incompetent, conceited individuals to the highest positions. How brainwashed did the general public have to be to think that they mattered in the grand scheme of things, that their vote would have any impact on their future? The Empire also had its own share of concealed lysabra diplomacy as she used to call it and wasn't necessarily more effective at optimizing the circumstances for its citizens quite the contrary, as even minuscule details like the location of the spaceport on its capital world had attested to. Yet, they had come far in building a cohesive working society, especially considering that the government providing trouble-free lives for those under its wing was precisely not the point. And that the council's main work had consisted of mitigating the damage wrought by the power struggles of lower-ranking lords and duffs and the occasional Moffal officer when they hadn't been busy joining the jolly backstabbing themselves, well, it was hard to justify imperial politics most of the time. However, there always had been the chance of the right person assuming power and doing away with all the inefficiencies and inopportune betrayals. The key was loyalty and the death of Vitiate, for whom the Empire had merely been a sandbox for watching a civilization rise, a people grow, only for them to be turned into a literal sacrifice incinerated at the altar of their uncaring Emperor's strive for immortality. They could have been so much more. But the past was dead. She wanted to kill those fools responsible twice over. On the other hand, the Republic was, by virtue of its very concept, predestined to mediocrity. Xyathris elected to take a seat at the bar to steal herself for more mindless chatter. Sipping on a whiskey she had randomly chosen from the extensive menu, she watched the other attendees with growing disgust and boredom. What a way to be introduced into the self-indulgent pursuits of the upper class. Even the drink in her hand was not something she would normally order, but constituted a probably unnecessary attempt to blend in. Xyathris felt disgusted by herself, considering the nonchalance with which she was conforming to these social norms. She invariably preferred non-alcoholic drinks, particularly various kinds of tea like most self-respecting imperials, especially those with a pure blood background, although the associated customs could not be more distinct. Another favorite had been a fermented drink called Ksat, a specialty of Ziest, where she'd spent her teens. Mainly for sentimental reasons, she had even experimented with producing Ksat on Odessan, an ill-fated undertaking because of the rather different climate. It had caused the beverage to reach the desired stage of fermentation far too quickly. 
After several weeks, she had improved the process sufficiently for the taste to approach the original, as confirmed by several Zeerste natives, most enthusiastically by Major Pierce, who had worded his endorsement virtually like a marriage proposal. After one of the vessels half buried in a small patch of soil within the Alliance complex had shattered, injuring a hapless Republic pilot, she had given up the pursuit lest it create even more tension between the factions involved. It was bad enough that Theron and Lana somehow had deduced the circumstances of the accident and kept making veiled allusions to their commander's uncharacteristically domestic pastimes. Nevertheless, going for drinks had often been a welcome change of pace and a bonding activity with her crew. A successful evening had consisted of a combination of the following set pieces, Pierce getting positively, crap, faced, which at first made him, even more, boastful and later, the inebriation slowly subsiding and giving way to a certain degree of melancholy, had him spend the rest of the outing glowering at Quinn. Vet chuckling mischievously while she told embellished anecdotes for her rapt audience of one, Jeezer. Zyathris leaning back to enjoy the scenery, occasionally giving a stiff back Quinn a sympathetic toast with a resigned smirk, which he returned warily. A less successful evening had usually ended with a lysabra waved in the face, or embedded in the guts, depending on the severity of the offense, of a patron for insulting vet or causing other kinds of trouble. Alternatively, on occasion, having to drag Jeezer out of the venue kicking and screaming. The cause for the latter scenario usually being that she had not yet mastered subtlety, namely the art of not giving your more or less consenting lover permanent injuries, which had tended to create a heap of flimsy work for her master, and by extension, Quinn, if said lovers had happened to be young imperial servicemen. Currently, it was a chore devoid of any such excitement. The only upside was that her new employer had sent her shopping first with Republic money, no less, apparently there was an allowance for the equipment required by senatorial aides. For the first time in months, she was in possession of several sets of clothing not scorched and ripped in several places or practically amounting to clone trooper underwear, although it was still not particularly suitable for combat. At least she had finally overcome feeling practically naked due to the lack of armor. Then again, if her peers back in the day had managed to survive four significant stretches of time with their midriff sped, wearing vests with plunging necklines or impractical capes or in general, just extravagant tunics with no defensive function whatsoever she was the one who was remiss in her over-reliance on armor. Knox had already given his reluctant approval on her current attire, while stating that it could do with a few tweaks for a more intimidating effect. He had apparent tuned out during the briefing instruction her not to draw attention needlessly. For someone who should have the life experience of an 80-year-old, plus whatever insights his ghosts had given him, he was surprisingly immature, but in a disconcertingly menacing way. He probably had got along absolutely swimmingly with Valoran. Provided they had not at some point started trying to outmaneuver each other, thus embarking on an absolutely vicious downward spiral. That alone would have sufficed to topple the Empire. If you prefer your whiskey on the smoky side, I'd recommend the Silver Falcon brand. A familiar voice interrupted her boredom-laced train of thought. She made an inviting gesture and, without further acknowledgement, placed an order via a dedicated data pad. Promptly, the droid bartender served two small glasses with a dark brown liquid. Oh. Her companion gasped. I didn't mean, a vintage. That's. Inviting a lady for drinks without paying for it. The corners of her lips twitched. Out of your league, Lieutenant. Face reddening, Lieutenant Mitekar fumbled for words, before she released him of his sorrow. Oh, quit worrying, I'll cover the tab, of course. Republic credits put to good use. 
She picked up the glass and raised it towards him. To synergy. To he hesitated, before his brain caught on. Synergy. Mitekar's eyes occasionally darting into her direction like a spooked torn tawns. They enjoyed the exquisite drink in companionable silence, before Zyathris spoke up. A pleasant coincidence. Did you have any success with the Acherans? Unfortunately, no. They turned the proposal down flat, saying they couldn't spare the resources. What with the revolution, it's somewhat understandable, but peculiar nevertheless, as we would have funded, well, never mind. I certainly did not expect to meet you here. What brings you to this event? Work. Zyathris replied cryptically. In what capacity? You aren't with KDY, are you? President Garage had mentioned the officer being involved in whatever odd string of events she was supposed to investigate, so the truth would actually serve as a little trap for him. I'm Senator Iskra's security advisor. Matekar did a double take. That explains a lot of things. But, your Akaram. I wouldn't not have guessed that, considering your, ahem, exotic looks. He quickly corrected himself. I don't mean to offend, it's just that you stand out, especially in comparison to the majority of Akarams, that still came out wrong. The potential inappropriateness barely registered with Zyathris, who gave an indifferent shrug. She had certainly been called worse in that regard mixed blood, impure, even traitor. Even the accurate and seemingly neutral hybrid was derogatory. As a matter of fact, all pure bloods were hybrids, just as probably every single human imperial had possessed a certain percentage of Sith genes. While the pure blood traits were largely dominant, once the fraction fell roughly below 40%, the individual was foremost intense and purposes human, with a far less extreme metabolism and lifespan, only vestiges of the typical ridges at best and skin colored in more or less noticeable shades of red. She just happened to come from a family with a strong history of interbreeding with human Sith. Despite that, her extended family had ridiculed her mother's choice to marry a Navy officer or rear admiral at that time no less as scraping the bottom of the barrel and desperation, insinuating that they had only formalized their long-running affair because Yerishi had fallen pregnant. That accusation was not even incorrect, but the tense relations had made Zyathris' childhood visits to her granddaughter's estate rather unpleasant, although most family members had come to terms with her background eventually. She had inherited her father's dark tan skin with just a dash of red and no bone spurs. Having foregone the traditional jewelry and tattoos as they were impractical and would only mark her as pretender in the eyes of traditionalists, passing for human was hardly a stretch. Currently, she might be in deep trouble if it were otherwise. That part of her heritage would be rather hard to explain away, if anyone happened to realize the significance. Mitekar had no way of being aware of those issues. Exotic isn't that wide of the mark. Technically, I hail from what you call the unknown regions. Garage simply hired me for the position. Out of curiosity, what did you take me for? I had not given it much thought. Probably just sleepless nights. Maybe half Zoltron, maybe a Zabrik ancestor, I honestly have no idea. I think I'll just keep you guessing. By the way, you lost a bet or something. Your snickering comrades over there watching us seem to indicate so. You are very observant. And they are being jerks. He gave a small sigh before continuing. This is embarrassing. A lifted eyebrow warned him that she would not let him off the hook. Fine. It's actually more of a death. I, um, don't exactly have a reputation of success with regards to talking with women. Can't imagine why. 
So you decided to play it safe and approach a familiar face. With all due respect, there is nothing safe about you, but that was the general idea, yes. Efficient. So the dare is what exactly? Simply talk. Check. Buy a drink. Debatable, but, check. Take her home. Freak, her senseless against a wall in an unsupervised server room. Matekar choked on the last sip of his drink. When he was finally able to breathe again, he all but whispered in a strained voice, the drink part about covers it. Anticlimactic. What do you get for passing this death? Does a couple of days without snide remarks count? He exhaled audibly, wallowing in self-pity. Thank you for the company. And the whiskey. The lieutenant hurriedly made to stand. I apologize for the intrusion. I shall return to the others. I wouldn't presume to take up more of your evening. She playfully but firmly grabbed his wrist. Oh, no. I'm enjoying this far too much. Why don't we bolster your reputation a little? With all due respect, you playing along out of pity is worse than the umpteenth rejection. Who said anything about pity? Mitekar's eyes widened, but he did not voice the thought clearly etched across his face, the alternative would be even more terrifying. Let me introduce you to my colleagues, then. Oh, by the way, I didn't get your name last time. Zyathris chuckled. Now, that would have been awkward, wouldn't it? Tilda 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 What Tashka sorry, Dr. Tashka, is trying to say is, the most brilliant minds of the Republic, assembled right before you. Your talents would be wasted on menial research, then. Zyathris goaded him, just for the sake of riling him up. Am I correct in assuming that you're all involved in state-of-the-art development projects? Of course. Top secret, though. He gave a conspiratorial grin and lowered his voice for effect. Could turn the tide of the war for good. HM. Obviously that's what you would say to impress someone. Too bad you can't back up your words or it'd be treason. The redhead spluttered, clearly too drunk to properly think through his pathetic attempts to get her to pick him over his colleague. The scientist named Tashka reprimanded him. No more drinks for you. Your successful presentation notwithstanding. The commander won't be happy if you show up completely hungover tomorrow. One of Mitekar's peers, the only other officer instead of a civilian scientist, pulled him aside. No idea how you managed to score a looker like that. But I feel it's my duty to warn you, mate. She's, like, a decade older than you and way above your pair grade. He swayed a little as he leaned down to whisper in his colleague's ear. That woman's gonna eat you alive. Thanks for the concern, Reman. Mitekar replied between clenched teeth. Tonight his colleagues were being particularly obnoxious. He just wanted to get away, even if it meant playing along with whatever his new acquaintance had in mind, which, going by his experience, had a similar probability of being utterly humiliating for him as staying had. Somehow, though, he felt more daring than usual this time. Triss, would you care for some fresh air? To his continued surprise, she nodded with a chuckle and intertwined her arm with his. Over his shoulder, Mitekar called out towards the general direction of his team, who were watching him leave with wide eyes. In case Krennic asks, I'm retiring early for the night. Unlikely, though, he muttered under his breath. Zyathris was not afforded much time to settle in on Coruscant, which was probably for the better. 
the capital world epitomizing everything wrong with the Republic. She was glad to leave it behind even temporarily to accompany the senator's other aide, Venyai Stava, to a summit of fringe worlds in an uncontested location. That undoubtedly meant another separatist ploy, but why the Acherans even agreed to such a meeting after the fiasco on their home was world beyond puzzling. She could not shake the feeling that Iskra was playing with fire to get to the bottom of the mystery President Garage had alluded to. Her research had not yielded much. She was hardly an analyst and Garage certainly had not hired her for that, but all the documentation she had viewed so far indicated nothing out of the ordinary for an underdeveloped backwater planet, except perhaps for various scientific consortia and potential buyers requesting access to Acre's uncharted mines out of the blue repeatedly within the past year or so. According to Iskra, the mines had been depleted millennia ago. A small team of experts had begun to debate that claim roughly a decade ago, providing evidence of small deposits of crystals, but up until the revolution, Acheran leadership would not have considered pursuing this opportunity further to stay in the good graces of the Republic, which restricted trade and usage of crystals. The Jedi Council reserved the exclusive right to decide how to exploit Kyber resources, if at all. Given the dire financial struggle of the Republic, it seemed highly improbably that they were trying to circumvent the Jedi in order to replicate Malgus stealth fleet or similar superweapons, but she would not put it past the Separatists, especially considering their reliance on technology instead of sentient manpower. On the other hand, it was hilarious how war sent people scrambling to reinvent yet another iteration of weapons whose plans were lost due to complacency of peacetime. Another piece of evidence for the superiority of rejecting peace altogether. Deep down, she knew she had to return to Coruscant, if only because so far it provided the closest link to the contemporary Sith she still had not given up on finding. For what purpose exactly remained to be determined, depending more on their goals than hers. What she had not accounted for was the Sith finding her first. A droid was by virtue of its nature not a particularly trustworthy face. Which made following it first away from the conference, then onto a ship with an unknown destination a rather unwise move, superficially speaking. The inconspicuous protocol droid had attempted to pressure her into complying of course, nobody was in the habit of asking politely nowadays, seemingly giving her no choice by threatening in his monotonely droning voice to release poisonous gas into the assembly room, thus killing the representatives. Certainly, she could not care less about the fates of the diplomats present, her temporary ward included, but she currently did not need such a pointless massacre blamed on her, either. The droid had clearly failed to calculate the scenario of her being willing to meet with his master, or dismissed it as too unlikely. However dangerous heading straight into the Takata's cave was, the unique opportunity presented to her with no effort on her side required was too good to pass up. Their starfighter attached to the hyperspace rings, there was no turning back now. Obviously, this has all the markings of a trap. You're the expert in springing traps, so feel free to share your experiences. Nonetheless, if that Dooku wanted me dead, he would not have instructed the droid to lure me out of the room under a pretense before employing the gas. Depends on what manner of death he has envisioned for you. In combat, then. Let him try. Having lightsabers with her would be beneficial in that case, but then again, she did not require them to defeat her opponents. Especially with her newfound talent for lightning that was the main advantage of Nox's presence, apart from the uneasy camaraderie. The occasional unnerving commentary was a small price to pay. Don't underestimate him. No need to tell me. What's the alternative to accepting his invitation? Shall we continue with these pointless mind-numbing endeavors, 
perhaps collect more Republic accolades in the process. I am a hero already, after all. Or do you have a better approach? The trace them through history method clearly hasn't yielded any useful results. Abandon the past altogether. So what then, maybe we should open an orphanage, wouldn't that be lovely? If it's going the same direction as your slavery business, I'm all for it. Might be a challenge to find suitable orphans, though. The Jedi Order might have a bit of an issue with that. Griff, you've actually got this thought through already. Sure, let's start our own order of murderous misfits. You've got to be kidding me. Perhaps I am just bored not a good state for me, I admit. Humor me while I try to be supportive for once, have you ever thought about what you personally want to do? The way I see it, you've always put duty first, to the Empire, to your crew, to the Alliance. You're practically a Jedi in that regard. A superlatively angry, possessive one, but still way too passive for my liking. My, you're in a kind mood today. Well, just keep digging your own grave. Don't come begging for mercy later, though. Mercy is weakness, we both know that. Nox chuckled darkly. My point still stands. What are your desires? You once had your path cut out for you privileged background, make it through the academy, survive your apprenticeship get revenge on your master. All the while making enemies and staking out your territory as you rise through the ranks. You were constantly chained down by the dynamics and expectations of the empire that you internalized as pragmatism and honor. It is obvious why you never attempted to rise above that on your own accord, you've not considered doing anything else, anything selfish, because it would serve no purpose to your mind. No wonder Ma took a liking to you. He always was too much of a realist and a politician for his own good. Roth. Commander. These are just titles others granted you, pushed on you even. You lived up to them, without doubt, because you're too stubborn for failure. But you did not actively seize the power that came with those roles and made it your own. You wore the masks fully expecting to cast them aside when the time came. Where is your ambition? What do you need power for especially now that everyone is dead? In fact, what do you even keep living for? Why not simply give up? At least I'm not a megalomaniac tyrant. Ah, such a negative view of power. What brought such extremism about? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Vitiate proved that. Is that so? I see, so that's what you are afraid of. Being too weak to handle the responsibility. Ironic, all things considered. Bear in mind, however, Vitiate's only purpose was amassing enough power to attain immortality. We were all just pawns to him. At no time did he actually care about the subjects he was ruling. You could not be further from that. A little thought experiment, imagine I had managed to claim the position of Emperor. How would I have fared, what do you think? You would have fared spectacularly once you'd shocked all xenophobic adversaries who won't bow before a Myri Allen Emperor into submission. Imperial citizens on the whole, Probably not so much. Xyathris suppressed a smirk. I envision your supplicants having to wade through a pool of blood of those who dared to look at you funny. And orgies in the council halls. Oh, come on. My rule would not have been, primarily guided by benevolence and efficiency, I suppose. But it would have been mostly just and with the best interests of all my hypothetical people in mind nevertheless. He grumbled don't you remember that young woman who wanted to crush everyone that opposed her ideas of reform. Our dreams of one day shaping the galaxy according to our will. To you, these dreams represent ultimate freedom. However, 
I've experienced the reality of ruling, and it's not at all how I imagined it would be. Because you did not want that particular role, because you were forced to compromise by the circumstances. There's no victory in that. Knox retorted harshly before falling silent. When he continued, his mental voice had taken on a wistful quality. It should have been one of us. Ruling the Empire. You were robbed of the opportunity and I, made a choice. A choice. I failed to mention that I killed Asina's successor, didn't I? I'm not surprised by this feat or your ambition, but it's difficult to imagine what must have transpired for you to end up trying to release me instead. Actually, it's not strange at all once you know the circumstances. Asina's rule was long-lasting and pretty effective, I initially supported her ascension, but that was before being robbed of my council seat not that it mattered much given that I joined the alliance soon after. You would have loved the direction she took the empire, even though she also used you rather unscrupulously. She allowed non-humans to serve in the military and official capacities. Granted, that was inevitable because the empire was about to run of warm bodies to send to the front lines. Yet, with duty came exposure and respect, making the life of aliens much easier. The reorganization of the council proved very effective especially once I replaced that weakling Anathal. Alas, Asina was killed by a Republic airstrike on Coralia when she came to dictate terms for the Republic's surrender of the whole sector. Turns out they also developed stealth technology, funny that. The Empire was in a state of shock for a few years as Asina's reforms meant there had been barely any maneuvering for higher position among the upper echelons. There were no suitable or willing candidates that survived the chaotic situation that arose. One promising aspirant tried and failed within weeks. It was the Council and the Hand that actually ruled during that tumultuous period. Obviously, we didn't make any progress due to their perpetual conflicts. Vauron declared himself Emperor eventually but was murdered by an CIS agent during his coronation. Pretty anticlimactic ending for one with such a predilection for subterfuge and scheming. A Darthiri, member of the Empire's hand at that time, came out on top during the chaotic struggle for the throne afterwards. Dismantled rather bloodily intelligence for failing to prevent the ambush as his first act. That alone would have served to prove what kind of leader he would turn out to be. The reconstituted impint under the auspices of our dear Cypher Niner's keeper had made a complete U-turn and devoted themselves exclusively to counterintelligence, leaving Recon to the military and random assassinations to bounty hunters as he put it once. They basically eradicated the CIS and related services, leaving the Republic floundering for decades. It had been glorious, the crowning achievement of Nine's single-minded quest for retribution. He was already going down that path during his time with the Alliance, you surely remember the spectacular standoffs with the Ron. Xyathris reminisced fondly. I do. Nine tried to poison you once because you kept coming to Shan's aid. Emphasis on tried, but it was a valiant effort so I did not resent him for it. Come to think of it, I'm not sure what broke him in the end, the way the alliance went up in flames or that the cis wound up responsible for that aristocrat's death. Griff. I'd wager it was the latter. Aristocrat Saga knew was like a beacon of home for Nine. I know he practically adopted the agent, although I always suspected they were in a relationship of some kind. They were very secretive about it, and it's hard to tell with Chiss. That would explain a few things. By the way, you keep alluding to what happened to the Alliance but refuse to explain in detail. Considering how well you took the realization that you've skipped a few millennia, I did not want to add to your burden. That bad. Very. 
I dare say only nine and I came out more or less unscathed. Odessan was turned into a wasteland. But the details of it are a distraction right now. Where was I? Ah, Keeper did not escape the new Emperor's perch, but he did give him a hideous disfigurement as parting gift. Unfortunately, Iri used that as an excuse to brand non-humans as potential traitors. His dreadful campaign broadened, harkening back to the worst days of the Empire. Relations with the Chiss soured, especially as our winning streak of the previous decades abruptly ended. They gradually withdrew their support as Iri kept using them in ill-fated battles, which in turn caused him to cut all ties altogether. If you're not with us, and so on, you know the drill. Why did you not act earlier? You had your chance even before Vauron stepped up. I admit I was too engrossed in my research to care about the grand scheme of things. At that time it looked as if my most important project was nearing successful completion. Alas, that was a gross miscalculation on my part. Later, the galactic situation created by Rhi's incompetence ended up setting me back several years. But I had been so close. Meanwhile, my body was showing signs of age take a guess, what's the average life expectancy of a Myri Allen having grown up a slave? But we'd lost Balsavis, so I had little choice but to press on with my research. When that sorry excuse of an emperor interfered with my affairs directly, he forced my hand. He died pathetically, a shriveled, charred husk, a fitting end for such a worthless creature. I did intend to take over the empire at that point, however, I figured that it needed a stable, consistent rule to rise again, and with only a few good years left in my body, I had to take the risk and use my research to prolong my life as had been the goal all along. I felt there was still a key element missing, so it would have been foolish to proceed without a fail-safe in place. The only other person I trusted to have both the strength and dedication to reform the Empire. You. And, well, you know the rest. Dang. Dang, indeed. Perhaps we've been given a second chance. Look around you. The Republic is crumbling, more cancer than healthy tissue already. Slavery and criminal activity is still rampant, in the core and the outskirts alike. There is neither equality nor order and everyone suffers for it. Not saying the Empire was truly better, but it did have the potential, with the right people in charge. Who, if not us? These meddling Sith instigating a proxy war. Well, what can we do? We have no credits, no ship no allies nothing, not even a proper weapon. None of which Dooku is going to provide. So unless you intend to kill him and take over his operations. Kill him? No, that would be premature. He claims he wants to talk that is exactly what I need him to do. The final room was devoid of furniture except for an unadorned throne standing against the backdrop of elaborately carved viewport style windows. The pale, greenish glow emanating from them represented the only major light source, tinging everything in the ghastly hue. The shadow cast by the lone figure on top of the low steps extended until the entrance as if to swallow up any visitor in the darkness. The way from the landing area had been flanked by a multitude of various types of battle droids, all powered down. Encountering another living, sentient being in this setting was as much a surprise as it was a peculiar relief, an imposing aura among the deliberate lifelessness of their surroundings. The clanking of the protocol droids scurrying gate subsided and a disquieting absence of sound settled over them, two predators wordlessly taking measure of each other. When the dark clad figure spoke up, the deep sonorous voice reverberated from the walls. So we meet again. Zyathris took a few steps forward and stopped short just before the bottom of the stairs. 
the setting certainly is more sophisticated than last time. She gave a mock bow, eyes fixated on the older man. To what do I owe the honor, Count Dooku of Sereno? Or do you prefer Darth Tyranus? Shall we finish what we started on Farinus too? I do not intend to press the issue. Our confrontation there was unnecessarily impulsive, but based on reasonable assumptions, given that you were in the company of a Jedi. Not by choice, I assure you. Becoming a tribute did not sound like a pleasant prospect and, whatever you have in mind for me here, I recommend refraining from attacking me again if you want to keep this civilized. And yet, you have followed my invitation despite your understandable misgivings. You have become quite a nuisance to the CIS. Why would you ally with the Republic? Well, it did get your attention, hasn't it? That was the very point. Tyranus seemed to have expected this kind of reasoning. A wasteful approach, nonetheless. On the other hand, it does allow us to meet in this way, though you could not have planned that. As you appear to be aware of my identity, it would be courteous to afford me the same privilege. I suppose it would. Xyathris Vescua, Wrath of the Empire. Officially former, but whereas the Empire has died, I have not. Tyranus' eyes widened, a flash of gold setting the brown irises ablaze. It is true, then, he whispered to himself. While I enjoy your hospitality would enjoy it more if offered tea and the like, has that gone out of fashion? As the leader of the CIS, you are unlikely to be bored or harboring a death wish, so what's the occasion? You should not exist. Ominous. And you intend to do something about this? Xyathris replied in a bantering tone, but her eyes darted around the room, searching for a possible weapon. Hands clasped behind his back, the older Sith descended the stairs, remaining just beyond the typical dual range. His height contrasted with his controlled, austere demeanor, amplifying the cold, unyielding pressure from his force presence. Having to look up to someone during a conversation was a somewhat rare occurrence for Xyathris, but Tyranus towered over her, taller by at least half a head his fairly advanced age not apparent from his haughty posture at all. You claim to be Sith, bearing a title that fell out of use in antiquity, a remnant of a long-forgotten dominion. I am not a relic to be studied. She snarled, much to Nox's amusement. If anyone is a relic, it's you. She snapped silently. I intended no offense. However, you cannot deny that your survival for what must exceed millennia is an aberration that bears investigation. The more interesting question is why you're not surprised by my revelation at all, but were completely shocked when we fought on Farinus. Have you grown so comfortable in your position that you no longer expect to be challenged? Not by a fellow Sith. Phrased as if it should be obvious, now that was a peculiar statement. Just how many Sith are there, in that case? Two. The curt reply hung in air between them. As the implication sank in, something in her shattered, and gave way to an overwhelming bubble of hysterical laughter. This extent of deterioration of her order appeared so outlandish, even the worst case scenarios discussed with Nox had not featured the Sith nearing extinction. To hear it from Tyranus himself. In the whole bloody galaxy. The man nodded slowly, his voice taking on a lecturing manner. Two there should be. No more, no less. One to embody power, the other to crave it. This incredible folly had been brought about on purpose. Who are you quoting? Darth Bane, the founder of this lineage. And this is the only lineage still active. She ground out. The question left the taste of ash on her tongue. Like the ash of her people on Zeist. Bane made sure of that, 
and for a millennium, no outside contenders for the title of Dark Lord have been allowed to rise. How? There were almost 10,000 Sith at one point. Far more, if we are counting the acolytes and youths not in formal training yet. Which time frame are you alluding to? The interest seemed genuine. The Great Galactic War, as history has come to refer to the era during which I was born. Impressive. He mused to himself. To answer your question, Bane endeavored to purge the Sith ways of the crippling infighting and short-sighted greed plaguing the Order, which represented the very reason for their continued failures. To that end, he ultimately unleashed a thought bomb, killing his brethren. He took one apprentice only, and it has been this way ever since. Thought bomb. Oh, Criffing Void, I don't even want to know how that works. Another super weapon, because why not? By exterminating his peers, he might conveniently also have committed genocide, at least it was a logical conclusion given that the pure bloods had disappeared along with the Sith Order as a whole. They might have bred the purity out by that point, but he still ended all those bloodlines, and reduced the Sith to this an elderly human male and his presumed apprentice. Xyathris clenched her fists. If we come across Bane's Force Ghost, how can we make him suffer? So you managed to keep going in this configuration all this time without, I don't know, someone dying in a speeder crash along the line. He shot her a stern, almost disappointed look. A Dark Lord of the Sith is not prone to dying in a speeder crash. Ah. Right. They also don't get swallowed up by lava, incinerated by orbital lasers or eaten by Kalor slugs. Except that they do. Tyranus inclined his head in mild puzzlement. Kalor slugs. Species native to Koriban. A real pest. Have they finally gone extinct or have you not ventured there? I have seen Moribund. He replied simply. Of course, why not rename our ancestral home which houses some of the most sacred, most powerful sites while you're at it? She hissed in indignation. This is absolutely ridiculous. In fighting is a weakness, I do not disagree with that. She thought of Barras and the countless deaths of loyal Imperials the duplicitous, idiot, had caused. Or the Void, Dang. Ed Emperor himself turning on his people. Certain victory has been snatched from our hands too often, countless devoted soldiers and citizens killed by selfish ambitions of Sith. Even the egotistical, deadly games played by the myriads of lower-ranking Sith had a tendency to affect more than those willingly involved. Many times, we brought about more chaos instead of the superior order we should have established. Nonetheless, how would this tenet of your lineage not result in a net loss of power and knowledge? You can't take unnecessary risks for fear of both exposure and accidentally ending the Sith altogether, making you unable to experiment with some of the more dangerous techniques and rituals. Thus, you can only scramble to preserve, never advance. Besides, What's to keep the apprentice from killing his master prematurely or in a fit of rage? How do you go about selecting an apprentice in the first place? You typically need a couple of iterations to weed out the weak, yet can't afford to lose time either. When to start teaching the next one, anyway? If you have multiple hopefuls lined up, they might team up against you but the alternative is having no contingency plan. Finally, not everyone has a natural aptitude for all disciplines, some are physically weaker but excel at sorcery, others have an affinity for saber skills, yet little patience for mental techniques. What you can't use you can't teach, either. Sith grow strong through conflict. Even over generations, this holds true, I will not deny that. The perpetual struggle for supremacy promotes the strong and eliminates the weak. 
the order as a whole remains vibrant and lethal as a result, despite the individual's ambitions and eventual fate. But your path limits expression of the dark side and amounts to glorifying decay. It's a path of fear. Tyranus appeared to consider her barrage of arguments, remaining silent for longer than she had expected him to. You fail to take into account that the Sith's goals and underlying dynamics could change. The intention is to foster a reciprocal relationship between Master and Apprentice a symbiotic one requiring a delicate balancing act by both parties. The obligation of the Apprentice is loyalty, the Master's is knowledge. Should either fail in his obligation, it is the duty of the other to destroy him. The Force requires it. An apprentice is unquestioningly loyal until the moment he isn't. Both master and apprentice know this. Degree. Symbiotic. Don't make me laugh. I killed my master because he was a treasonous prick that would discard me like a tool. He never taught me anything, except for being wary of betrayal. Most Lords and Darths had multiple apprentices who usually did not draw lots to decide who gets to kill their master. There was plenty of other competition to take up all of their attention. As for the force requiring it, I am quite sure that most Sith that came before Bane would consider this heresy. Doctrinal issues aside I will admit that I never cared much for that. It is usually too stifling on an individual level what happened to subjugating the force, make it an extension of your will. Instead you prostrate yourself before its supposed will, allowing it to limit you. The force should be our servant, it's the Jedi who have it the other way round. For some reason that seemed to upset the older Darth tremendously, his voice trembled as replied, making an effort to word it tactfully. You certainly provide a perspective that has been lost to history, I am afraid. Your rules allow the most extreme and ruthless to advance, those who are most suited to subterfuge, but not the most knowledgeable or powerful. Kurat had the sky and jat shays at hl heskem john too. Asterisk the phrase was an old axiom describing the plight of imperial refugees after the great hyperspace war. Tyrannus drew a sharp breath as he processed the unexpected language switch and stumbled through the foreign words in his halting reply, the consonants gratingly colored by basic. Jaloksh Midwankan. Asterisk asterisk it was a wise rejoinder, if a little ungrammatical and lacking an awareness of the cultural background. Kuskut Tarshik. How can you be more than a pretender, a dark Jedi with a fancy title? when you don't even speak the old language properly. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. He would fail at anything but the most basic sorcery, then. Knox remarked gleefully. You speak with a heavy accent, too. It is not about perfect pronunciation or even being able to hold a conversation in high sith, but confidence and ease. Both of this, he lacks sorely. It turned out that the former Dark Counselor was more than capable of affecting the clipped quality of the standard Imperial accent, something not found his speech ordinarily. He picked up on her perplexity. I speak and read several languages, hence, if necessary, an accent certainly isn't a stretch for me. Learned it to wind up the wrong. Spy games in the bedroom. He wouldn't have appreciated that. So just to rub it in how you've compromised him. He had worked with Binico, Cypher 9 and you long before I met him on Yavin 4, so he was well compromised already. Meanwhile, Tyranus had explained, among other counter-arguments to her criticisms, how he was perfectly capable of reading Kitat. It was at least something. Yet, all of these weaknesses are painfully obvious and you even recognize some of the shortcomings. You had 1000 years to develop a better philosophy, no one forced you to stay true to Bane's ideas. Has no one ever questioned them? You seem like an intelligent, reasonable man. 
Are you continuing this foolishness with your own apprentice? Tyranus adopted a sly smile. Ah, you seem to act under the wrong assumption that I am the current master. Well, in that case you don't have much time left to learn. She gave a faint chuckle. You probably take the record for oldest apprentice. Unless your master is unusually long-lived, you must have either really shown promise or, could you be a former Jedi? That would make sense considering the personally upset way Kenobi spoke about you. As if not by his own volition, Tyranus took a step back. You have met Obi-Wan Kenobi. Ah, an old wound indeed. Briefly, but amiably, gave me a lift off Tyranus. He seemed rather distracted by his upcoming mission at the time. A sloppy gloss over, but Tyranus did not press the topic. For all it's worth, he is my grand Padawan. Given that both of you are still alive, how did you mask your Force presence? You are suppressing it now, I can tell, but that would not be enough to fool a Jedi. A kind of passive meditation. Counter question, how are you doing it? I am not doing anything of the sort at the moment. But, the eyes. That does not require conscious effort. The color change only occurs when I actively draw on the dark side. That's new. Don't think it's actually possible, unless one's really weak, which he can't possibly be. Or light-sided, perhaps, but his actions prove otherwise. Jesus had this obsession with finding light-sided Sith. I forbade her to seek them out figured that was a problem which would take care of itself and did not require her overzealously disrupting Imperial operations. A pity, or we might have learned more about them. Even most students on Koriban did sport the yellow permanently towards the end of their training. Haven't encountered any lords without basic signs of the dark. Would you mind indulging my curiosity, Tyranus? Why did you become Sith? The Separatist leader began circling around her slowly, an unnerving move even though he gave no impression of malicious intent. The Jedi deliberately limit their usage of the Force. I sought to integrate the light and the dark so as to gain superior power. The galaxy is heading for ruin. Someone had to step up to rebuild it from the ground up and I am suited, even destined, for that role. The Jedi refuse to bear the responsibility and do what must be done to bring order to the Republic. The Senate is ineffectual and deeply corrupt, but still the order allows itself to be put on a leash by politicians like degenerate arc dogs. Degree degree he stopped his pacing to lock eyes with her, challenging her. Pray tell, Roth, do I qualify in your esteemed view? Actually, it's not what I expected at all. But it's the classic Revan Gambit sacrifice yourself to the dark to save the world and have your values turned upside down in the process, thus becoming destroyer instead of savior. The original premise that lead you away from the Jedi sounds slightly flawed, however. I can't imagine a Sith opting for the light side to supplement his skills. Your master allows this delusion, encourages it even. I suppose he welcomed it as a way to lure me away from the Jedi, but how I approach the Force is not something he overly concerns himself with. Your political views are hardly typical for a Jedi, why would you consider such extreme measures necessary? Could change not be affected from within, such as a reform of the Jedi Order? The Republic is beyond saving, the decadence and vice run too deep. As for the Jedi, they await the coming of a prophesized Redeemer who will bring balance to the Force and restore order. Here is the truth of it, the Jedi could fulfill the prophecy on their own, if they were willing to unleash the full powers of the Force. Degree 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 Typical. I think I understand why you chose the path of the Sith. This thinking is utterly incompatible with that of your former peers, 
who are content to wait for the force and delude themselves with the soothing thought that the will of the force will make everything all right. We know better. Passivity, stagnation are weakness. Our cautious little dance is a welcome change of pace, still waiting for that tea, by the way, but I must ask again, what did you bring me here for? For years, my master has withheld vital knowledge from me. What a surprise. I mean, you'd have no reason not to kill him otherwise. He truly did not need to I was convinced that we share the share overarching goal and would not endanger the grand plan for supposed personal gain. My position as the figurehead of the separatists requires me to act independently of his guidance in many cases. Naturally, that involves the risk of unwittingly jeopardizing key pieces on the Digeric board. In an attempt to reveal more of my master's plan in order to avoid such complications and thus, failure, I happened upon information that caused me to doubt his intentions. Already somewhat disillusioned, I delved further and found my suspicions confirmed. Your idealism blinded you to the true nature of your master. Alas, that is true. During my research, a peculiar side note in ancient documents caught my attention. The legend of a sleeping warrior, the eternal wrath, who would one day awake to avenge the fallen empire. The symbolism associated with the story curiously coincided with the primitive lore of the Faranasi, who claimed that they were blessed by the patent god of lightning with superiority over their surface-dwelling counterparts in exchange for keeping his treasure safe until the Great Reawakening. I convinced them the time had come, and they offered to hand you over but insisted that the removal from Stasis could only take place on their planet. He clarified. Knox. Well, in my defense, it was a good place to hide the throne after Odessan was ravaged. Getting the locals to protect it was a stroke of genius. Perhaps. Might take a while for me to get over the God of Lightning part, though. Hilarious. Unaware of her mental conversation, Tyranus continued. I gave them the technology and returned later to retrieve you, to find that the Jedi had got to you first by sheer happenstance. You were in a sorry state, but I let you live. I did not expect you to become such a nuisance, but the opportunity outweighed the risk. I hope you don't expect my gratitude. Now that you have told me of your intended treachery not that I don't approve what kind of opportunity are you talking about. I would offer you the same thing I once offered Kenobi join me and help me kill my master so that we can change the course of the galaxy according to our will. Intriguing. You don't really take your rules seriously, do you? Xyathris scoffed. Does needing help not imply that you're too weak to take the mantle of master? Not if my master doesn't adhere to them, either. How did Kenobi take your proposal? To my utter disappointment, as you'd expect from a brainwashed, dutiful Jedi. Deliberately turning her back to her interlocutor, Xyathris walked up to the windows and crossed her arms, staring into the distance. If I am to consider this, I expect a full disclosure. What is your actual role in this war? And how would your master betray you? Tyranus came to stand beside her and studied her expression from the corner of his eyes. The separatist alliance is a pawn. I figured as much. You built it up as the Republic's nemesis. Eventually, it will take the fall, in the wake of things to come. A very astute observation. It is supposed to become a necessary sacrifice, paving the path for the new government. All this time, I assumed I would be afforded the opportunity to forswear my former allegiances and, emerging with my reputation for integrity intact, be instrumental in the foundation of a new order. Degree degree. Instead, you will be cast aside, too. I understand your predicament, I was once in a similar situation. 
I am curious as to how you arrived at that particular conclusion. Firstly, your rehabilitation remains a somewhat risky wager for your master. No threads linking him to the duplicitous game he is playing, no loose ends sacrificing you along with the separatists would be much cleaner. You're a former Jedi, that will always be attained, a lingering doubt that you have the capacity to be sufficiently ruthless and will stop at nothing you fell once, the pendulum could always swing into the other direction. The third indication comes from that stupid rule of yours. You are old and still the apprentice. Hence a confrontation at the height of your power is no longer possible. You have little chance of overpowering him. Even if you did, you don't happen to have an apprentice of your own hiding somewhere. He made sure of that. Came the bitter reply. Of course he has. Once the galaxy is in his grasp, he has no need for rules and philosophies that limit the extent of his power. If he is victorious, he will fashion himself the Sith Ari unless this concept has been lost to history as he is the one to ultimately bring about the culmination of generations of planning your revenge. He remains a creature shaped by the rule of two, though. He will view the existence of multiple Sith as an inherent weakness. Can you imagine him bringing the galaxy to heal and reshaping it into his empire, only for him to die eventually of natural causes? I know I would not allow that if I were in his place. I would have the solution to that pesky problem, too. So must he, otherwise he would not move as swiftly and confidently as he does. Essentially, if he expected to die so that the next generation could carry on with the fulfillment of the plan. Griff. Instead, it's all about him and will always be. That belief allows him to deviate from the rules all the others who came before him followed docilely. So that can only mean one thing. She could vividly image Nox Feral grin as he heard his reply. Immortality. She carefully voiced that realization to the other Sith. Thus, the Banit lineage ends with him. Continuing it would not be in his best interest. He won't want a powerful apprentice who could endanger his rule. Encouraging competition amongst his servants and enforcers is not an option either because that would create a situation anathema to Bane's philosophy. So he will be left with no successor. Who would maneuver for decades and instigate a war on this scale to create an empire from the still smoldering ashes of the Republic, if only to let it plunge into chaos after a couple of decades? Tyrannus appeared to grasp the gravitas of this line of thought, and all but whispered. He would not. His master dabbled in such things, but... But your master has not shared his insights with you. The older man gave his quiet acknowledgement, still reeling from the implications. It was not that he had not considered the various possibilities, but to hear it from another, another Sith, was rather sobering. His master had withheld so much from him or perhaps not even he held knowledge comparable to that of one that had lived during one of the prime epochs of the Sith. Is it likely that he has already succeeded? Hard to tell. Sorcery. Alchemy. Coupled with potential technological advances of this time, there are quite a few theoretical options. Such as. I've thought about this very topic a lot. Heh. I doubt you could find anyone with a similar expertise. If we model the force as the underlying continuum, the fabric of galaxy, localized changes like death on a massive scale, create a temporary imbalance, a gradient that causes the force to flow until the equilibrium is restored. Given enough strength or another kind of connection to the original event, one can direct this current. If handled badly, it can collapse into a singularity, like a black hole, for example ripping a wound in the force through which it bleeds and stains uncontrollably. 
The precedent for this would be the actions of Jedi Exile who accompanied Revan when he tried to assassinate Vitiate. At the Battle of Malacca, she somehow drew the current into herself but was likely overwhelmed, turning her connection to the Force into a corrupted conduit. A similar thing probably happened to that pseudo Darth Nihilus, but unlike the Exile, he has never been studied. Barring such an intervention, the Force flows naturally to fill up the negative space over time. Vitiate siphoned that off, leached on the war between the Republic and Empire our philosophy of progress through conflict played into his hands. Ironic, huh? I have come to the conclusion that rather uniquely he also developed an active method of causing this flow without requiring an external cause, case in point being Zist. Void, dang, exist. She had not expected it to cause a flare of pain still. It had not been her home world, but close enough, with it housing the Navy Academy she'd attended briefly thanks to her father's influence and to sense Pierce's howling fury. To feel so helpless, so hopeless in the face of Vitiate's overwhelming power and the inevitable machinations that had brought both Republic and Empire to the planet in the first place. It may sound like a similar concept, but it is definitely more than a far-reaching death field, more than feeding off your enemy's energy or even reaching into yourself in order to use pain and so on to heal yourself. Knox continued his lecture. Living beings are tethered in the Force, which is an access point so to speak for those techniques. Your predecessor as Roth was instead cut off from the Force and attached to an artificial source that redirected flow, making him somewhat dependent on Vitiate. He was no longer subject to natural processes, like aging or death, but had no access to emotions either. One could theorize that all these manipulations would be difficult or impossible with a light side approach not to mention anathema to the Jedi. Especially considering that Scourge managed to reattach his tether with help of a Jedi, linking seems to come easier to light siders than separating, but that's to be expected. What Vitiate did to Zeist, is on a whole other level, as he ripped out these tethers by the roots to feed off them which requires acting directly in the fabric of the Force. That approach gave me an idea. Manipulate the Force to draw sustenance from it this is the intuitive part which both of us are familiar with. However, if you take this far enough, you become a Force Nexus, which makes the process self-sustaining. You still have to take the equilibrium into equation, but what this entails is not comparable to instigating a galaxy-wide war. The drain would be subtle, dispersed, with no discernible influence. It would be as if crops on a planet grow a fraction slower or everyone else dying a split second earlier. Immortality without the messy prerequisites or side effects. Quite so. How close were you? As I said earlier, if not for a tiny detail, almost there. I suspect that Vagel's apprentice carried on his research after his master died, but whatever he found out, it never made its way onto my desk. If these Banit Sith dabbled in this topic, well, I want their knowledge no matter the cost. And they cannot be allowed to attain immortality. I am glad we are in agreement. Actually, with that kind of power, one could likely create life itself, which opens up a lot of nasty options think necromancy and way beyond and some nicer ones, like solving our body sharing problem. An immortal army of raised dead, who doesn't want one? As for the latter issue, can't you just continue body hopping? Like Vitiate did with his voice, or if I remember correctly, Zash attempted to. Technically, I suppose I could but in my current state I am afraid it would be at the expense of the host body and I like you far too much to even consider that path. Looks like we're in this together for better or worse. Definitely not a trajectory I imagined my life taking. None of this is. I'm sure you'll take it in stride. 
I will not become your enforcer, Tyrannus. Nor shall I lower myself to becoming your apprentice. I have no need for traditions. The new order will be a joint effort. And given your superior knowledge, I shall gladly accept your teachings. My master has not shown willingness to teach me anything beyond the necessities, and much was lost in the dark ages before Bane's time. I was a fool for not realizing much sooner that he harbors ulterior motives, that our goals not aligned. It appears I have no place in his vision, which makes me doubt his plans for the galaxy. What do you envision, then? We shall establish a government to embody authority. There will no place for political squabbling or inefficiency born from pandering to the ignorant. Instead a pure, direct rule of power made manifest to bring order, an empire of man with no concessions granted to degenerate filth. Degree degree. I assume it is not a coincidence, then, that the separatists consist primarily of non-humans. Dooku's look was bland. Of course not. Their wealth will serve us well, however. Degree degree. Idiot. Dot. Nox growled. Patience, my dear. I could not care less about the CIS, but we will be there to influence the course this endeavor takes. In the meantime, let's allow an old man to hold on to his delusions xenophobic delusions. It's moments like these that make me question whether I can truly trust you after all. You've just described 90% of my interactions with you. In any case, I do not begrudge your automatic mistrust of normal humans, but as a knee-jerk response to everything, it's very unhelpful. Normal. He emphasized dryly. As in, being the norm the standard for evaluating others. Looking down on them. You know what I mean. Language matters. Technically, as Myrie Allen, you are near human. So. Unhappy territory. So there are bound to be differences. Such as. Griff, you're making this difficult. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that a Biff or Taz is on the same level as you and I, species-wise? Where do you draw the line, Nox? Now you are the one making it difficult. And what of the Jedi? She inquired to get a better impression of Tyrannus, of whether he still held a modicum of whimsical attachment to the beliefs he had grown up with. I do not wish to see the Jedi eradicated, unless necessary, merely expunged of the disease-like weakness which has spread through their ranks unchallenged for generations. The order is too slow to embrace change so it will be shattered and remade according to the tenets of the Sith, and emerge stronger than ever, no longer chained down by pathetic squabbling politicians. An army of enforcers for the new empire. Degree Degree Xyathris pretended to consider the offer before turning towards Tyrannus. We shall make all this become reality, together. What must be done to bring your master down? Finally, his eyes lit up, a fiery blend of yellow and crimson. For the time being, there is little you can do. I must first uncover his contingency plans, of which he is bound to have several. I have identified multiple leads already. The grand plan is close to culmination, so we must be able to strike without delay as soon as the time has come. For now, you must remain a mystery to him so that he does not suspect me. I understand the necessity, but this course of action is rather unsatisfying. As a token of trust, at least give me the name of our mutual enemy. There was little hesitation. Darth Sidious. It is known even to the Jedi, though they are unaware of his public persona. Tyrannus' lips curved in a faint smile. There might be something you can do in the meantime. What does this entail? I have learned of a Jedi shadow, 
who seems to have made headway in locating an important Sith holocron. Sidious will take measures to acquire it once he is briefed on the details. You haven't informed him yet. No. He has sought this particular holocron for years, it was assumed lost but he likely already no progress has been made. Considering he has never seen it fit to task me with its retrieval, he must want it for himself. It would fall to you to extract the information from the Jedi. Obviously, I am unable to go myself. However, with your tendency to stumble into our operations, you will not arouse undue suspicion, especially if you manage to leave no loose ends, Sidious will be none the wiser. If Sidious wants it at this point, we must obtain it. Please? I agree, no wheedling required. Pretty much everything beats the inane pastimes I've occupied myself with so far. Killing a Jedi even more so. I accept. I shall send you the details and provide you with a neutral ship. Zyathris gave a formal nod, of the kind one would acknowledge an equal with, as she turned to leave. May the Force serve you well. The, dang, Ed Jedi was dead. Obviously so and not just since recently, judging from the state of decay. Now, reducing the situation to that basic fact appeared quite anticlimactic, but there was no point in sugarcoating it. No holocron in sight, either, thought that was by no means surprising. Technically, Tyranus claims had not pointed to the device being in the shadow's possession. But as the circumstances presented themselves to her, the failure of any indication of it to materialize was yet another item in a string of curious coincidences. When she had arrived on the unnamed moon, passing through the blockade of a few light cruisers of unidentifiable allegiance had been a straightforward affair. The subsequent landing, if it could even be called that, less so. Upon her entering orbit, Almost as if on cue realistically speaking, it probably was, a CIS capital ship supported by a handful of frigates had dropped out of hyperspace. Her fumbled attempts to raise the shields were cut short when a stray volley of fire hit her vessel by all calculations she should have been beyond their aft cannon's active targeting range. Considering that soon after, a squadron of fighters broke formation to chase after her. The possibility that there was more to it than accidentally getting caught up in the crossfire was not to be dismissed. Shields had gone up around the damaged hull just in time to prevent the ship burning up from the velocity alone. Nearing ground, she had managed to decelerate the descent enough for an emergency exit as in, jump ship and do not waste a thought on the debilitating idea that this time her mastery of the physical aspects of the force would not suffice to make the inevitable impact survivable. It turned out a close call indeed, no thanks to the unusually high gravitational pull. The problem lay less with her than with the ground itself, which did not lend itself to the application of kinetic energy, to put it mildly. Despite every single muscle in her body howling in protest, she had rolled away barely in time to evade the jet of hot and as she found out later caustic gas streaming from the crack in the surface her forceful landing had created. The ship crashed in the distance and was swallow up whole, a greenish flame flaring up and illuminating the cloud of gas and dust rapidly forming above the jagged crater. The planet easily surpassed Quesh in term of toxicity and general unpleasantness. The only upside, or downside, depending on one's outlook, was the lack of a preceding vaccination with side effects as nauseating as breathing the atmosphere itself. The surface was arid and unstable, as evidenced by the myriads of geysers and little steaming mounds covering the area creating a landscape reminiscent of the bumps and sores caused by the smallpox variant endemic to Bosada. The dry, sweltering heat was entirely within expectations and barely worth a mention. Upon closer inspection, the sorry state of the shadow was not terribly surprising he had perished close to a fissure emitting noxious gas, after all. 
there existed no signs of a fight, no discernible wounds on the body not inflicted posthumously, except for a peculiar smear of blood and what looked oddly like brain matter beneath his nostrils. Even the Rhodian's lightsaber was corroded to the point of uselessness, except maybe as an improvised grenade if the power had not fizzled out. His last act seemed to have been operating a makeshift communications array, but why he had not taken precautions remained a mystery. If anything, it was quite out of character, presumably, for a man that had trained for prolonged solo missions and should be resourceful in addition to being hyper-aware of his surroundings a result. In itself, the Jedi's death was not a great loss, but if whatever knowledge he had gained of the holocron had died with him well, that certainly was irksome. The faint tug in the back of Zyathris' mind was unremitting. There was someone or something watching her, though she could not pin down why it felt so disconcerting. If it was not abject foolishness that had killed the shadow. Most importantly, why had he been in such an apparent hurry? Dangerous as it was, the planet was not about to fall apart and there was a kind of settlement nearby which even housed spaceships. It had sustained some damage recently, judging from the caved-in dome and characteristic gas clouds hovering above. No inhabitants visible. Ships. Plural. Things were getting more interesting by the minute. Zyathris willed her throbbing limbs forward, cautiously making her way towards the array of buildings discernible from the distance. Even though an outpost of this size would require at least some maintenance personnel, there was no one visible. Extending her senses confirmed that there were other sentients present, filaments of pain and horror wriggling madly in the force. A piercing scream from one of the domes adjacent to destroyed Central One caught her attention. She peered into the room. Inside, a petite girl brandished a blue lightsaber in panicked, jerky sweeps, her back pressed to a stack of anthracite crates. In the dim lighting, her large bright eyes stood out in contrast to her soot-covered face, like stars on the canvas of the galaxy. There seemed to be a body lying next to her feet. Show yourself. She yelled with the commanding tone of faked confidence. What was she so afraid of? She could not possibly have sensed her approach. No, there had to be another threat. Zyathris took a few measured steps towards her. The girl pointed her saber towards her. There's more of you. Her instincts had been right. I have no intention of harming you. Who else is here? A faint flicker of hope welled up in the girl. Are you with Master Iquano? The dead Jedi up there. I was tasked with investigating the proceedings on this planet. It appears I have arrived a tad late, however. Zyathris laced her voice with regret. In her shaken state, the girl would not suspect anything amiss. He contacted you. I hoped he got a transmission out, but it didn't look that way. I had no direct contact with him, all I was provided with were these coordinates and a vague description. What's a child like you doing here? She sensed the worry of the diminutive humanoid the species was entirely unfamiliar with head appendages not unlike seed pods and her bond with the barely alive person splayed on the floor. Their dull robes gave them both away as Jedi. However, the girl seemed too young to be a Padawan, at least one taken along on outbound missions. My master and I investigated Jaiquano's disappearance. We were too late, as well. And then, my master got injured. Her eyes flickered towards the still form on the ground, grief welling up in them. Someone attacked us there was a scraping sound from the other side of the room. Has been hunting us watch out. She raised her saber to illuminate the ceiling, but the assailant she sensed had already dropped to the ground behind Zyathris. Having anticipated his attack, 
she ducked under his strike despite not seeing it and extended her arm in a force push. The expected feedback of the force impacting with her opponent never came. Instead an unnatural calm settled over her. The flames of Aya dancing in her being doused with a spray of water, gentle yet malevolent at the same time. By all accounts, the sensation should have been a most horrifying one, but she felt nothing except for a tender but insistent pull drawing her forward. It grew exponentially as she came closer and finally yanked her to her knees. The thought of even putting up resistance was so absurd. She shoved the malicious presence out of her mind. Something thin and wispy, not unlike tendrils, brushed her face when she charged at where she sensed the attacker. This time, she struck true, sending him falling backwards. While she could still sense him acutely, he quickly disappeared into the shadows, his humanoid shape blending with the unlit edges of the large room. What the criff was that? She cursed as she backed towards the sphere of light cast by the Lysabra. He killed your master. No, that wasn't him. The girl winced, before adding indignantly. Also, Master Ritven still alive. Barely. Could have fooled me. Her ribcage touched the Padawan's shoulder, allowing her to feel the ebb and flow of the girl's trembling while she attempted to rein in her emotions. How long has that thing been hunting you? Since we got here, I guess. Revealed himself after we had found Equino's body. My master fought him off and protected me, but when the starfighters fired on the dome, the assassin suddenly ignored us. That coincides with our arrival. Oh, it sure does. I have a nagging suspicion, though only academically, who that attacker might be. Or at least his species. Whatever you do, stay clear of the tendrils. Xyathris held out her hand expectantly. Your saber. Why? I can't just. A lightsaber is a Jedi's life. I need it to protect my master. And I need it to protect all of us. My weapons were destroyed when my ship was shot down. If only she had had proper weapons with her to begin with. But it's dangerous for non-Jedi to wield it. That's what the Jedi would tell you in their hubris. Besides, if you think I am putting my life in the hands of an untrained Padawan, you are sorely mistaken. Now give it to me. Reluctantly, the girl complied, mumbling sulkily, Please don't break it, I made it myself. Glad to see you've got your priorities right. Xyathris replied with an amused snort. Take shelter. Do not interfere in any shape or form. She gave herself a moment to orient herself in the room. A flat spacious dome housing many crates and what looked like maintenance equipment. Little maneuvering room, lots of potential cover making the terrain perfect for ambushes, so engaging the opponent head-on to overpower him quickly was likely the best tactic. She located the assassin's signature and, having identified a clear path to him, thumbed the lightsaber off, plunging them into complete darkness. Boosting her strength and speed with the force, she dashed towards him and reignited the weapon just before reaching him for a surprise attack. However, his reactions were exceptional he evaded her strike just in time and parried with his own staff. Being much shorter than the Sith, the confined space they fought in worked to his advantage. His astonishing strength became apparent as they traded strikes she even had to switch from her favorite duo to DJEM so in order to counter his brute physical force. This could be over already if she could apply the full range and extent of her abilities. Once more she regretted having to put on an act. How Sidious managed to avoid exposure while at the same time having impact on the course of the galaxy was beyond puzzling unless he was a bloody politician or something. 
the strange ghoul she'd felt earlier tried to lure her in once more. She resisted it effortless this time, but the brief distraction afforded the assassin an opportunity to knock the saber out of Zyathris' hand. Darkness engulfed them once more and she felt the menacing proximity of the alien. She sidestepped his next attack and shoved away his arms as anger welled up in her. Her hand shot up, fingers curling into a fist. Her opponent struggled against the incorporeal grip, but he was pinned in place, helpless as his throat constricted and oxygen flow was cut off. Time to put an end to this. To Zyathris puzzlement, the summoned saber flew into her other hand with considerable delay, she could viscerally feel the crystal's reluctance to serve her. It was not the first time she'd sensed this kind of fearful reaction in a Jedi's lightsaber, but even that of Night Bacon had put up less of a struggle. When she plunged the blade into her opponent's belly, it wailed, as if offended to be made an instrument of death. She dragged the weapon up slowly and with relish, essentially cutting him in half from the chest up, while ignoring the crescendo of the agonized keening from both the crystal and the her victim. When she released her grip, he dropped to the ground, lifeless eyes blazing over. The former Roth knelt down to examine the body. I was not mistaken. An Anzart. They can sense someone's strength in the Force, it makes them hungry. No wonder he ignored the little Padawan in favor for you. He must have fed on the Jedi Shadow, that's why he was so formidable. Nox supplied his observations. Literally. As in, the mucus was actual brain matter. Yep. They are accomplished assassins by necessity, always hungry for their next victim's force essence they supposedly call it soup. Though the manner in which they consume it is a little extreme. Ever wondered where the original Sith species got their inspiration for your lovely, time-honored traditions like blood soup from? Seriously. It is a fringe opinion, but well backed up with literary references. Considering it's mostly folk tales, I won't vouch for it, but it does make a lot of sense. Does that connection offend you? No, I always found these customs unnecessarily crass. Besides, I was raised by my mother away from a traditional pure-blood household and my father would have frowned immensely upon such things. I sometimes partook in it when she had a pure-blood student or with my relatives. But you should have told me if you were interested in participating in the ritual. Aunt Shiarized would have loved to host a counselor for the occasion. There was repulsed sensation. Ah, I forgot, my Aurelians are vegetarians. Please do forego the green skin color jokes. Well, you must admit that considering your bloodthirstiness, it's quite hilarious. I eat ghosts. I have no need whatsoever for eating my enemy's physical body, or that of any being which is not a plant. Tush. A high-pitched whirring sound drew closer. The fighters were circling back. Where is your ship? We need to get off this volatile rock. The Padawan stared at her with a shell-shocked expression, unable to reply. Zyathris had dispersed the dark side effects immediately after the battle and everything the girl might have sensed could be blamed on the Anzart. Still, she attempted to send soothing vibes towards the girl through the Force, which seemed to put her into a numb state instead. Good thing I don't have children. Oh, I don't know, you would make a better parent than most Sith. If the responsibility had become too much, you always could have sloughed the brats off to pierce. He did vow to train your army after all. I am sure your offspring would cut as such. The resulting mental image was as hilarious as it was bittersweet. What did I say about rummaging around in my brain? To remind you, a couple of thousand years with nothing to do. For better or worse, there is not a single memory I have not seen. Griff you. Oh, 
by the way, does that work both ways? Probably, though you do not want to see my memories, trust me. Let me be the judge of that. Even if it's only for blackmail purposes later on. Don't bother. There's nothing in there that could hurt me anymore. And starvation. Being beaten or punished by watching your friends getting tortured and killed. Being raped well, it hardly makes for good entertainment. That's... Just what do you think happens to slaves on a daily basis? She let out a breath she hadn't realized she was holding. I hope you made the perpetrators suffer. Oh, suffer they did. Knox replied airily with a hint of sadistic glee. An explosion rang nearby, finally jolting the girl out of her trance. You actually, how? She whispered, not quite registering the urgency of the situation. Where is your ship? Zyathris repeated impatiently. In the hangar, came the slow reply. Rolling her eyes, she grabbed the girl's arm and pulled her towards the entrance. No. Wait. What about Master Ritven? The Padawan writhed in the grip and failing to free herself, dropped to the ground like a dead weight to slow Zyathris down. Please, help me with him. He is as good as dead and carrying him will only serve to slow us down. His fate will be the same as ours. The girl stated with a finality that stood in stark contrast to her age. Zyathris stared into the bright blue eyes, and with a frustrated growl, let go of the Padawan to walk back to the crates. She hoisted the limp form of the injured Jedi up and slung him over her shoulder. Thankfully, the Duros was quite short for his species, but running was still cumbersome, with the added weight, the ground gave in much more quickly beneath her feet. The lithe Padawan did not have that problem. Lead the way. I am going to haunt you personally if we are swallowed up by a chasm because you needed to be a dutiful little Jedi. The Jedi's ship was still intact. Thanks to some impressive piloting on part of the young Jedi, they escaped the fighters and made it into hyperspace. Zyathris ducked back into the cockpit after administering basic medical care and injecting the Duros with the highest dose of sedative the chart in the medkit deemed safe for his species. Better not complicate things by having him wake up, but if he was like most masters in that he kept knowledge from his student even about the mission he might still be useful in the long run. I did what I could for your master used up what little supplies you have on board. He is no longer dying, but in a very serious condition nevertheless. The burns on his back are horrendously inflamed, probably an infection from the surface particles. They also cover too much of his body's surface area to be survivable without treatment. Not sure if his face can be fixed without a transplant, either looks molten off as if he's been doused with acid. That can't have been the Anzart. What happened? He, shielded me from an explosion. One of those fissures blew up when it was hit by a starfighter's shot. The Padawan closed her eyes, face scrounged up in concentration. He is in excruciating pain. How can you tell? Feel it through our training bond. It was a great boon that a Sith Master and Apprentice pair typically did not develop such a connection, as it would complicate things immensely. Don't blame yourself. He made that choice. It's not your fault that he was too weak to shield you both properly. My master is anything but weak. Then why is he lying there? The girl took one last look towards the prone form, then turned towards the view screen her face hardening with resolve. I set course for Shabba. We don't have enough fuel and stabilizing fluid for longer jumps. There is a small agricore facility, they might be able to help him. She exhaled shakily. Thank you for saving us. We would not have made it without you. I'm Katuni, by the way. 
You can call me Triss. What was Equano doing on that planet? Honestly, I am not sure. He was a shadow, a kind of investigator. He tried to get a message out, routed it to every relay station used by the Jedi it must have been urgent. Zaya Thris slid into the co-pilot's chair and leaning back with a stretch, placed her booted feet on an inactive part of the steering console, which earned her a stern look from the Padawan. Any idea what the intended transmission was? We found a recording of it, but, my master told me not to watch it. My master this, my master that you're beginning to sound like a slave. Has it occurred to you that with Equano dead and your master incapacitated, you're the only one able to complete the original mission? If you don't, their deaths yes, I am still doubtful about that man's chances she inclined her head towards the back, will have been in vain. I don't even know what the mission is. I'm just a Padawan. What's your role in all of this? You arrived at the same time as the Starfighters, were they after you, then? If you're trying to put the blame on me, I suggest you to re-evaluate your teachings. The Wrath crossed her arms. Let me get this straight. You master drags you halfway across the galaxy to come to the aid of an elusive investigator you have no idea what he has found out without telling you anything of use leaving you to fend for yourself in the event that something happens to him. Is that a normal thing for Jedi, putting young children into harm's way, on a planet like the one we narrowly escaped from, with a battle raging overhead? I need to learn what it means to be Jedi after all, so how else would we do it? I turned 14 a couple of months ago. If I hadn't been selected by my master before the age of 13, I would have washed out of the training altogether. That seems a wasteful practice, especially considering you're at war. What happens then, you return home. Younglings have no family to go back home to, we were brought to the temple as babies. During infancy, Zaya Thris inquired, aghast. Her own upbringing had not been that different from non-force sensitive children, except for a larger emphasis on physical training and enduring hardships. Proper training in force techniques usually begun with adolescence. Affluent families would send their children to specialized private institutes or independent tutors like Zyathris mother had been whereas children of ordinary citizen received their preparatory training at various academies attached to a more prestigious advanced one like Onziest. Slaves and unremarkable individuals discovered as adults generally got dumped on the academy's doorsteps with little to no preparation. At no point were children or youth sent into war. With their inferior numbers, that would have amounted to suicide for the Empire. The youngest age at which one could see real action was 19 if one entered Koriban early or was fast-tracked. Even during the incursion on Koriban, the youngest students had been sent to seek shelter instead of being wasted as minor obstacles made of flesh. The Padawans she had encountered had been close to her own age, and if the Rons and the hero of Tython's stories were representative, there had been had no propensity towards snatching little babies from the bosoms of their mothers. So you don't even remember your family? No. We can avoid the perils of attachment this way. Denying such an elementary experience was incredibly cruel and unnatural even by Jedi standards. Slaves, just like the clones, with self-imposed chains they wear proudly. Expendable, too. No wonder they're mindless drones spouting slogans of peace and serenity. It's easy to be selfless when you have any sense of self drilled out of you from birth. Precisely. Coupled with the empty promise of an afterlife in the Force, they have little to live for. Perfect, willing sacrifices for the greater good. Knock spit out. They don't have to be strong individually, they are practically cannon fodder by the very definition of their order, 
flesh shields for politicians and the wretched, ungrateful masses alike. Um, Triss, can I get my saber back? There was little harm in humoring her. If Katani felt safer with it, well, most Jedi had a strangely sentimental attachment to their weapon. She tossed it towards the girl in the pilot seat. You mentioned that you built it yourself. Of course. Katani replied excitedly. I got the crystal from Ilum. It was not easy. Pride seeped into her words. So you ran into trouble. Zaya Thris prodded with a jovial grin. Tension easing from her face, the Padawan told the story with almost infectious enthusiasm. So the question remains, has Tyrannus betrayed us? I am loath to give him the benefit of doubt, nevertheless, it would seem like a terribly roundabout way of attempting to kill me. If he is afraid of facing me in open combat, he could have sabotaged the ship he gave me, provided me with the coordinates to a singularity. Just about any other course of action would have had higher chances to succeed. And if I was supposed to be a distraction while he procured the holocron by other means perhaps that's where the Anzati assassin comes into play why lie to me about it. Provided even a single thing he told me was true, he'd be a fool not to ally himself with me, even if he would intended to discard me afterwards. Perhaps he had to put on a show for his master. Nox sighed. Well, he would not be the first Sith with trust issues. Obviously, but since everyone involved is acutely aware of this fact, he could have adjusted the plan accordingly. Thus he gave you only part of the picture. Possibly. He's going to answer for his actions, one way or another. Let's see what we can find out with the help of the girl. She could not help her curiosity. Are these real? Zaya Thris gestured towards the tendrils on the girl's head, who had been gently twisting them one by one with her fingers as she worked. Ah, you mean if the tendrils are part of my body? The Padawan's brows furrowed in confusion. They are. Have you never met a Tholotheum before? There aren't so many a eh? she corrected herself, cursing inwardly, near humans where I come from. At least there hadn't been many in a visible role, besides, the Empire's reach had not been so all-encompassing that they had amassed slaves more exotic than Zabrax, Myrielans or Evoki. And she certainly had never paused to enquire about the species of the various Republic opponents she'd killed. In the grand scheme of things, her own survival and advancement, there was little difference between slaying a Neku or a Cathar commando, except for battle tactics, obviously. I think I understand. I've been on a diplomatic mission to an outer rim planet with rare contact to outsiders, these people grew up very sheltered. Katuni bit her lower lip. They tend to react with instant prejudice. Yeah, that was common in my society, too. Was. They lost a war and were wiped out. Oh. I am so sorry. Katuni's heartfelt empathy was tangible, a nauseating kind of pity. Don't be. In hindsight, I am sure they brought it on themselves. That's cold. The Padawan cocked her head and peered at her inquisitively. You are telling yourself this as a protective barrier against the pain of loss, aren't you? Trying to psychoanalyze me. Are you always this nosy? I apologize, I did not mean to. Zaya Thris waved her hand sharply to cut Katuni off. Don't bother apologizing. I could not possibly blame you as an individual for the views you hold. The way I see it. You've been taught all your life to look to your superiors your masters for how to think. As evidenced by your instant backpedaling as soon as you hit opposition and your self-deprecating manner. Your capacity for empathy, for emotion, is a strength, but you're allowing others to shape you, 
to restrict what you're naturally capable of. But that's what the path of a Jedi entails. We live to serve. The Tholotheum countered. And did you choose this path? Are you allowed to question, to set your own priorities, at least within the confines of the rules of the Order? Katuni remained silent, mulling the arguments over. Didn't think so. Tell me, though, what is the most basic explanation of the Force? Ah, it's kind of an energy field surrounding and residing within all beings, that binds the galaxy together. So if the Jedi did not exist, what difference would that make to the Force? I guess a master could give you a more satisfying answer. It's... I don't know. None, probably. Reassuring to see that the brainwashing does not work perfectly for everyone. So regardless of what you do, benevolent and honorable as it may be, the Jedi are merely a religion, a codified way of accessing the Force for people who have an affinity for it. But once you can wield the Force, how do you decide what do to with it? If the Force is in everyone, just less tangible, everyone's actions matter. You don't have to be a Jedi to impact the galaxy, do you? Now the Jedi, being more powerful, need to be more responsible, but in the end, it comes down to your own decisions, your own morality that is entirely separate from your connection to the Force. If you kill, conceptually it's no different from when a soldier kills even though you turn it into a spiritual issue, your opponent is dead as a result. And if you stay your hand because you're supposed to avoid killing, even in the case of criminals, thus allowing them to escape, are you not responsible when they go on to murder innocents? You could have prevented that scenario if you had followed through, after all. If your moral values were absolute, you would go out and preach to everyone that they should act a certain way, to refrain from cultivating anger for example. If it isn't, why do you regard yourselves as beings exempt from, even above the natural laws of the galaxy, and thus, the Force? I had never considered that angle. The Padawan's curiosity was genuine, though it was obvious that she fought hard not to appear shaken by the direction the discussion was taking. May I ask why you even preoccupy yourself with, such topics? I think most people don't waste a single thought on why we do what we do. They are generally happy to receive our aid without wondering what our philosophy is. Let alone having opinions about the Force. I've done academic research with regards to the Force, though I would not claim to understand it the way a Jedi does. Still, well versed in such matters as your masters may be, non-Jedi are allowed to analyze your beliefs. Your doctrine grows in the absence of outside input, so it tends to reinforce itself. In a way, the Jedi are just as sheltered as the people you encountered on that diplomatic mission. The difference lies in what their exact confines are, what they are prejudiced against. You mean the dark side? What you said earlier about absolute morality you think there is no real difference between the light and the dark side. A fearful jolt went through the Padawan, who sat up straight as a rod, her posture as tightly controlled as her emotions, causing Zaya Thris to wonder if she had pushed too far. Now, I did not say that. However, one tends to wonder where your harmony and peace are in this time of all-out war. Or whether it is healthy to deny all emotions. It makes for a very restricted existence. Don't get me wrong I myself claim to be free of attachments, so in that regard I would be not in any danger of falling to the dark side. Oh, the irony. But to spend my life without knowing passion, or without experiencing the guidance and love of my parents it's unfathomable. I freely admit that we both have our respective limitations, yet I acknowledge them while striving to be free of those shackles whereas you are forced to believe they are what defines you. You would be utterly lost without your chains, because you took what's oppressing you and turned it into the basis of your identity. 
eyes wide, Katuni inhaled slowly. That's, that sounds so harsh. She replied in a meek voice. On the Jedi. Xyathris retorted with a shrug. It's supposed to. I am not trying to manipulate you I have nothing to gain from disorienting a child, merely show you that there is more to the galaxy than the confines of your teachings. Ultimately, you are responsible for the path you choose. Of course, you may choose to surf, nevertheless, having learned that lesson the hard way, I'd advise you to always question who and what ideals you are truly serving in the long run. Should you ever find the result of that introspection lacking, don't forget that in the eyes of the Force if not the Jedi you are free to forge your own path. A beep from the data pad interrupted their discussion. The girl, who had been listening to that last admonition with her mouth hanging open, spun around, took a glance on the screen and exclaimed in triumph. Well, at least the seed has been sown. What are you working on? I decrypted the transmission. The hollow message part of it, anyway. There's an attachment with a stronger encryption that will take a while longer. Let's hear it, then. Katuni nodded and pressed a few buttons. A hollow cording popped up between them. Asterisk this is a high priority message. To all seekers on the attached list, your operations have been compromised. Converge on the known coordinates to resynchronize in accordance to protocol Oric 7. Jaequano out. Asterisk. Ha. Huh. Cryptic. Not much to go by. Oric 7. Does that mean anything to you? No, I think that's something only a sentinel would know. Perhaps a master, too. And the rest of it. Hard to explain without describing the internals of the order as well, Xyathris raised an eyebrow poignantly. Fine, just, just promise to keep it to yourself, okay? Like the shadows, the Seekers belong to a special group of Jedi, Sentinels, serving under the auspices of the Council of First Knowledge. So they act independently of the High Council and thus, of the war effort as a whole. That's why they have their own protocols and mission perimeters. I read about the Ruusen Reformation, does that not contradict the principle of accountability to the Senate? Xyathris prodded. Ah, uh, politics is not my strong suit, well, I guess it does give us a bit more leeway. Besides what the Sentinels do is Jedi stuff that does not concern the Republic directly. In any case, the Seekers are responsible for finding Force-sensitive children and bringing them to the Temple. So if their operations were compromised, well, how can you botch snatching infants from their families? The former Roth massaged her scalp to alleviate the stress. How do they identify the suitable candidates in the first place? Through meditation. All I know is that there is a list of them. A bounty hunter stole the holocron used to access the list from the temple archives a while ago, but it was returned safely soon after, so unless it's been stolen again, Katuni looked away uncomfortably, giving a one-shouldered shrug. I guess we should just try to retransmit the message from Shabba. There is little else we can do about it anyway. Xyathris nodded absent-mindedly. Something about the situation rubbed her the wrong way. It was not exactly wise not that she expected sound strategic thinking from the Jedi in general to draw the Seekers together in one place during a war of these proportions, was it? And if Sidious had attempted to obtain a list of Force-sensitive children in the past? Just like that, she had become entangled in yet another Republic mess, but why would Tyranus send her there under the pretense of getting a holocron? Unless this was actually a trap for the Darth, perhaps a two-pronged one that would hurt the Jedi as well. Had he already become expendable? If so, Sidious' plot must have reached a rather advanced stage. They were running out of time, 
and with Tyranus out of the picture either way, having become useless or turned against her. These far-fetched assumptions were all she had to base her planning on, yet there seemed to be a kind of resonance in the force when she contemplated them. She did not like the consequences at all. For Nox Sake, she'd give the holocron angle of the whole thing another attempt, but if that failed, there was only one place left where she could find answers. Vitiate's method screw it, let's simply kill all of these pesky, worthless creatures was becoming more appealing by the day, but she owed it to herself not to sink that low. And the Jedi laughably claimed the dark side was the easier path. Shabba looked a lot like the hollows Xyathris had seen of Dantuin and all those other agrarian planets supplying food to the core worlds. Such planets were a luxury not available to the Empire. Surely, food crops could be cultivated on many worlds beyond the Stygian caldera, but due to the harsh climatic conditions, the selection and yield were generally very limited. Agriculture on Zeist had consisted mainly of livestock, with the exception of root vegetables, shrubs with a meager yield of berries and resilient grains. There had been not a single Zeisty dish not containing meat or dairy in some form. Dromund Cass had an ample supply of edible freshwater creatures as well as a variety of fruit, but the latter had to be rationed mainly for local consumption. Her birth planet of Bosidar had been one of the most fertile worlds, thanks to the more temperate and varied climate ranging from mountainous to oceanic, providing, among grains and fruit, 95% of the herbs and flowers used for tea in imperial space. Koriban, well, some spices and edible lichen had been exported from there. A stout zebrick with a weathered face welcomed them, bowing curtly. Greetings. I am Kravar Sajur. What brings you here? Katuni stepped forward and pointed towards I'm Padawan Katuni feel. Master Ritven, was wounded, he needs immediate medical attention. The Zabrik glanced between the girl and her tall companion, clearly puzzled that they were not a Master Padawan pair. Of course. We will do our best but bear in mind that our facility has very limited medical capabilities. We are equipped to heal work accidents and such, not major injuries sustained during off-world missions. With that, she walked up the ship's ramp towards the cargo bay where the patient lay. After examining the Rodian with growing horror, Sajor wordlessly gestured for two others to bring a stretcher. She then led Xyathris and Katuni towards a small round tent near the landing area. Please, take a rest. Paidawin feel, I assume you're not trained in the healing arts. Humiliation flickered across the girl's features. No, I just learned the basics literally everyone here has. There is no need to feel ashamed. We all have different strengths and weaknesses. Our unity is what makes us whole. Reaching for a colorful earthenware jug, she poured them two cups of a thick purple liquid, which gave off a pungent aroma. This will help you restore your strength. Katuni eagerly took a sip and instantly launched into a coughing fit. Thank you, Madam Krava. She choked out politely, tears welling up in her eyes. After tasting the steaming beverage cautiously, Xyathris finished her cup in one draft and held it out for refilling without so much as acknowledging the older woman. Despite the haughty attitude shown to her, the Agricor member complied serenely. Imba root and chipali pepper. A local favorite remedy for almost all minor ailments and an effective tonic. She turned towards the Padawan again. Rest assured, Padawan feel, that we will do everything in our power to heal your master. Unfortunately, he is not stable enough for further transport to another facility, so until we can call in outside help again, we must make do with what we have. What would prevent you from establishing contact with other Jedi? 
the whole sector is cut off by a separatist blockade of all hyperspace lanes leading though it, of which there are woefully few out here. In addition, they appear to have destroyed our long-distance relay stations. What? Katuni jumped up from her cushion. But we have a message that needs to reach the council as soon as possible. Paydawin feel is correct. The consequences could be dire if they are not informed. Is there no alternative means of communication? Failing that, do you think military help will arrive anytime soon? Zyathris added when the Zabrik hesitated. I am afraid we are not privy to the Council's decisions and Republic strategy, Knight. This is Master Triss. Katuni supplied in a hurry before she could reply herself. She was sent for backup. I see. Well, Master Triss, the blockade was established two days ago, obviously we've been out of contact since. What's the goal of this blockade? Besieging a whole sector seemed overkill even for a holocron heist, which once more pointed to the proceedings being part of a larger scheme. Forgive me for my ignorance, but our main occupation is agriculture. As far as I know, the Jospro system itself has no strategic value. A ripple went through Katuni's head tendrils. But it lies squarely between two major theaters of war. Passing through here would be the most efficient way to shuffle troops or send supplies. Well observed, Paydawan. Zyathris praised her exuberantly, feeling a little foolish for joining the charade. Madam Sajur, would you kindly take point in caring for it then? It would be great loss for both the Order and young Katuni here if he failed to regain his health. As you wish. The Zabrik bowed her head and ducked out of the tent. How can you stand that level of spiciness without even breaking a sweat? The Paydawan asked when they were alone. Zyathris shrugged. I barely noticed it. Not all species have receptors for spicy alkaloids. Lucky you. Can't you release the pain into the force or something? When I am eating or drinking. I don't think that how the force is supposed to work. The former Roth gave her a grin. Well, you tell me. Why the subterfuge, by the way? I didn't want her to question our intentions. I have no idea how to explain your role in this without raising alarm. So, um, what exactly is it that you do anyway? The woman sighed gravely. You have placed a great deal of trust in me, so I shall return the favor. Officially, I am a security advisor to Senator Iskra Avakara. In reality, the job's more along the lines of an independent investigator. What do you investigate? Inconsistencies. Weak spots. Who actually pulls the strings in this war? Whoa, like a secret agent. The Ron would be so proud. But how would that lead you to Master Equano? At some point, we followed the same evidence, apparently before he uncovered the issue with the Seekers. Zyathris answered evasively. Now, have you decrypted the attachment? What? Oh. Sorry. I completely forgot about it. Katuni whipped out her data pad. Great, it has finished already. She scrolled through the data and tilted the screen towards the woman afterwards. See, it's a list of names all right. Bad news is, I don't know anyone on that list, and there is no additional information. The Sith let out a yawn and launched into a series of stretching movements to increase circulation. It had been a while since she had last slept. What if you just meditated on it? Perhaps that'll give you some insight as to what's going on. Katuni looked unconvinced. I guess I could try that, but... If the Force can show you how to assemble a lightsaber, as you have told me, it can bloody well tell you something useful about that list. 
I'm going to have a nap in the meantime I tend to get irritable due to lack of sleep. At least without using appropriate force techniques and forward slash or stims, sleep deprivation was one of her least favorite hardships. Probably for her crew, too, who'd found regularly themselves on the receiving end of her mood swings if they'd woken her at inopportune times or if a mission had dragged out for too long. She awoke to the ashen face of the Folotheum girl. I think I found something, but it's vague and terrible. Xyathris made no effort to get up. Well. The Padawan waved the data pad in front of her face. This name stands out. Raumaman. Coincidentally, his last known location according to the database is here in the Jospro sector. When I meditated, I saw him briefly, losing a battle, sensed his pain. And then there was only snow and such cold, she shivered involuntarily. Is there a nice planet or one with cold poles in the sector? I already checked, there are two possible places. Your call. You mean we should go there? But I can't leave Master Ritven here. Do you think he would appreciate your ignoring this opportunity? What good will you remaining by his bedside do? But how to determine where we should go? Xyathris rolled her eyes. The same way you found out about Maman. Good thing you're so young, you still have much to learn. They had left Ritven in the care of the Agricor medics. Whether he recovered or not was not a concern for the former Roth, but he would do as a backup plan if their current lead failed to yield results. Maybe he could shed more light on the situation than his Padawan. Sajor had been most concerned about their sudden departure, however, with the relay stations gone, there was no risk of her calling in reinforcements that could wreak havoc on her investigation. Shivering due to the lack of proper clothing on the ship, they had found two warm robes roughly in Katuni's size and a stiff blanket-like contraption that served as a coat for her much taller companion, they trudged through the waist-deep snow on the moon the Padawan had felt most confident about among the potential candidates for the Seeker's hiding place. I take it your vision was not particularly detailed with regards to Mamun's precise whereabouts. Xyathris could sense the presences of more or less sentient life forms nearby but none of them had anything close to the aura of a Jedi. Sorry. It just doesn't work that way for me. I've just started my apprenticeship, skills like that are really advanced stuff. The Padawan replied, yelling over the howling of the freezing wind. You said something about him being in pain. How about you concentrate on that part? Sometimes. Clearer insight can be found in the less comfortable aspects of life. Moments later, the girl stopped in her tracks of all sudden, almost causing Xyathris to bump into her. There is something, but it's so dim, I can't. The former Roth placed her gloved hands on the Folotheum's shoulders, steadying her. Focus on it. Invite it in, let it fill you, allowing it to grow to become more tangible. Katuni shuddered violently now. It it hurts, she whispered, her voice cracking up. So much, I can't. Concentrate. The harshness of the command did not register with her. Is the vision more discernible now? A trail, of blood. It glows, in the force. Good. Follow it to the source. Xyathris coaxed, delving deeper into the meditation herself. I squeezed shut, the girl reached forward, grasping at empty air. It's slipping away. She gasped. Grip it tightly. The woman's fingers dug into Katuni's flesh, intensifying the pain she felt. Yank it back. With a high-pitched scream, the Padawan dropped to her knees disappearing completely in the snow. Xyathris pulled her back to a standing position and spun her around to face her. Tears streamed down the girl's cheeks, 
freezing as they dripped from her jaw. I know where he is. She gestured weakly towards a hill not far from their position. This way. The young Jedi leaning on Xyathris for support, they walked silently for several minutes before Katuni spoke up, still shaken from the ordeal. Whatever that was, just be glad you can't sense such things. It's the worst feeling I have ever experienced. Xyathris chuckled quietly. Oh, you have no idea, little one. Relax. You did what was necessary. It is over now. Out of curiosity, what was it like? Horrible. Like something was lurking in the shadows around me waiting for an opportunity to strike, to rip flesh from bones with venomous fangs. Whispers on the edge of hearing, cursing me and making alluring promises at the same time. And I felt so exposed, like there was nowhere to run or hide, because it would always find me, attracted to the light within me. She shook her head, as if to clear the memory. But the strangest thing came at the very end, when I reached for the fading trail, I could feel it pulsating in my hands, as if it was a beating heart. It tried to wriggle out of my grip, so I held it with all my strength and in that instant, everything flipped upside down and I felt so, so powerful, like I could shape the world if I just pulled hard enough, made this dreadful thing obey me somehow, a faint shadow briefly slithered over the girl's features. This sounds crazy, doesn't it? Not at all. I understand why it frightened you so much. Your teachings must contain some advice on how to deal with such experiences. Ah, this was but a taste, a glance into what could be, from the safe confines of the shield I put up around you. It was easy to see why someone would be enticed by the prospect of such power and also why it would feel like a fall from the limited perspective of a Jedi. They do, but I am not sure I am doing it correctly. No matter how much I try to release it into the Force, it just bounces right back. It does seem plausible that without specialized techniques, her connection to the light will object to such a dark experience being poured into it. If that's the case, the Jedi would be rather ill-equipped to withstand the lure of the dark side. HM. Inexperienced as she is, she might mistake her own suppressed guilt for the feeling of rejection. It's fascinating, how easily the dark came to her. With you amplifying her guileless attempts tremendously. Poor girl. As if you give a, dang. But the fact remains, she does have a very intuitive and precise access to her emotions. Well, I have seen many terrifying things in my life. The only counsel I can give you is not to suppress the memory entirely. It will only fester in secret and turn into something uncontainable. Stake out a limited space within you, this way you control it instead of the other way round. I will, consider it. Katuni sighed dejectedly. In a rather hilarious twist of fate, the presences she had sensed earlier turned out to be a small tribe of Taz. Territorial Taz rather unhappy to see trespassers on their land. With the girl begging her not to simply cut them down and the snowstorm making this a somewhat awkward idea anyway besides, there was no telling what would happen to Mamun in that case Xyathris decided to put her meager knowledge of Tazi to good use. Knowing the aggressive species, the encounter would result in a battle regardless but at least one that constituted a primitive approach to diplomacy. K.A. Cheeky Musmarsha. Chipla Pizil Zetai. Katuni stared at her with wide eyes, clearly impressed by the throaty buzzing that sounded nothing like talking. You speak their language. What did you tell them? That we intend peace and a really stupid way of asking whether a Jedi is at home. Dot. The Sith shook her head at the ridiculous phrasing. At one point, I had a Taz, a uh, bodyguard. He was a bit deranged, though. That's a blatant understatement. Yeah, 
tough competition for your dash aid with regards to who had the creepiest servant. I would have given Brune Mark to you as a gift if he had not been so infuriatingly loyal to my Sith clan. You could have gone on murderous rampages together by the light of the setting sun. That would have been such a lovely sight. With a lackadaisical shrug, she went on to clarify, I know about 30 Tazi expressions, with most of them expletives and gory threats, the greatest marvel is that I can form a useful, if grammatically dubious, sentence in the first place. The second biggest wonder was that the sounds she was able to produce were intelligible to the furry creatures even though being a far cry from their actual speech due to the limitations of her vocal cords. The Taz who appeared to be the group's leader, and was almost three times as tall as Katuni, buzzed a reply. What was his response? No idea, but it sounded unconvinced, to say the least. Zyathris took the knife she carried with her and carefully placed it on the ground between them and the natives like a barrier. What does that mean? Katuni Pright, watching the exchange with amazement. Nosy little Padawan. An invitation. The Taz reached for his staff and crossed it over the weapon already lying in the snow. Well, he accepted. You may want to take a couple of steps back. Katuni might have expected a lot of things to happen over the course of the day, but not for the tall woman to swiftly shed her coat in order to engage the leader of the natives in unarmed combat. It was a messy brawl that she surmised could be a ritual way of establishing superiority. Nevertheless, one had to be quite insane to even consider taking on a massive creature like the white-furred natives. Her companion took quite a beating but it did not seem to affect her much, shrugging off what should have been bone-crushing attacks. After a vicious but surprisingly brief fight, she emerged victorious straddling the Taz back in a choke hold, though how she could exert enough pressure on the creature's airways to actually bring him to heel like this eluded the Padawan. Taz Diplomacy Zyathris explained as she got up, face flushed a deeper shade of red from the exertion and cold. Ooh her. Katuni murmured, snapping out of her dazed state. We call this aggressive negotiations. Unofficially, of course. You know, negotiations involving a lie sabre, she trailed off awkwardly and helped Zyathris wrap the cumbersome coat around her body again. Here here, the Jedi have a sense of humor. The Taz leader, who had risen to his feet as well, made a vaguely placating gesture and indicated for them to follow. Rao Mamun was actually there, segregated to a small chamber in the cave dwelling of the tribe. That was the good, although by that point not terribly surprising, news. To their chagrin, his physical state was hardly better that of Katuni's master, though he was conscious at least. Just not exactly coherent, which made extracting information from him a chore. He seemed relieved to see the face of a fellow Jedi, but his croaked warnings made little sense. The elderly human appeared feverish, a deep festering shoulder wound oozed putrid liquid. It was unlikely that he would survive and in the harsh weather, attempting to move him was out of the question. A few hours later and there would have been no answers to be found here. Zyathris' patience was diminishing at a rapid pace. Would you please try to get some boiling water and a clean piece of cloth from the Taz? Eager to help, the girl complied, not questioning the order. Once she'd left the small side cavern, Zyathris turned to the Jedi. It's time you talked, old man. A gloved hand swiftly covered his mouth, effectively silencing his screams. Belderone. Zyathris stated flatly when the Padawan ducked into the cave again, carrying the requested supplies. That's where the Seekers are converging. Master Maman, are you better? Katuni hurried to his side, but her face fell when she noticed his condition. 
His eyes were almost comically wide in horror, but he was unable to get even a single word out. He had some kind of seizure. I am so sorry, Katuni, but I am afraid his chances of survival are low. The Padawan nodded sadly and took the man's hands in hers to calm him, gently massaging his palms with her thumbs. His eyes flickered towards her in gratitude but then he continued to stare at Zyathris with the abject desperation of a dying man realizing that his life's work might have been in vain. Is there nothing we can do? The infection is too advanced, a mead pack won't suffice and the Taz are too primitive to be of any help. Zyathris lowered her voice. He was a lucid for a moment while you were gone. I know what is going on. Take your time, make his final moments more comfortable or whatever you need to do. I'll be waiting outside. Katuni poured herself into the task. She did not see the wicked grin the woman gave the seeker before turning around. His breathing became labored soon and stopped minutes later. Zyathris slowly unclenched her fingers. It was a mercy, really. Katuni came to sit beside her companion in the main chamber not long after, shoulders slumping. I wish I could have done more. She sighed. Tradition dictates that we burn his body. Zyathris refrained from rolling her eyes. Well, we could always blow him up or something. Let the Taz deal with the corpse. He is gone, one with the Force, isn't it? Rituals like that won't do anything for him. We need to get going. But you said we had time. A little twist of the truth for your sake. Now he is dead, I am sure you'd rather concern yourself with the living. I'll give you the details once we get to the ship. Katuni breezed through the pre-flight checks and quickly brought them into orbit. Belderone is not that far from here. But with the blockade still active, she started twisting her tendrils again, apparently an unconscious habit that surfaced whenever she was thinking deeply. We could go via the Aurel sector. Make our way towards Ossus, there are a few minor trade hyperlands nearby. That's the easy part. The jump from there to Belderon is where it gets dangerous. Many who ventured to Ossus to plunder the historical remains of the Jedi Library have lost their lives there throughout the centuries. No matter. Set course for Ossus. She punched in the coordinates and then looked at the older woman expectantly. Right. Advance warning, you're not going to like it. Zyathris began her explanation. Mamun did receive a transmission from Equano just not the one we saw. The real one that the Shadow sent while he was still alive. I suppose he was already being hunted by the Anzart and requested help. Mamun came to his aid, was injured and fled to this planet all before you arrived. He seemed to have good relations with the Taz. Perhaps he underestimated the severity of his injuries and hoped they would be able to help him. Oh. He might have been this system's watchman then. Most simultaneously fulfill the role of seeker as well. Possibly. There might be another factor, though. Both Jedi injured on that toxic planet suffered from a ravaging fever, the inflammation spreading really fast could be either a natural pathogen or something the assassin poisoned them with. Mamun might have chosen this planet specifically in order not to spread the infection. But what about Master Ritven? I don't think we need to worry about your Agricor friends contracting something we did not sustain major injuries planet side and seem to be fine, after all. But your master might be dead already, if that's what you're asking. Impossible. Katuni gasped indignantly. I would know. Let me guess, your training bond. Yes she hesitated. I have not been able to sense him properly for a while, though I don't remember when that started. After our arrival here, I guess. 
The connection feels strange now, muted. Oh. Oh indeed. Ahem, maybe it's just the distance. Could be. The more experienced Jedi claim that gaining insight from the Force, especially things like premonition is much harder than it was in the past. Or I am just too weak. Interesting. It did explain why Zaya Thris was able to get away with drawing on the Force in progressively bolder fashion without anyone around her being the wiser. She had assumed that the Dark Shroud on Coruscant would have such an effect, but to hear it confirmed was another matter. The undercurrent of the Dark Side had become the Jedi's baseline, making it more difficult to discern its usage. Having reached its present level, it would also confound their senses and cloud their judgment. The Tholotheon had calmed down again. But who sent the other message, then, and why? I can't say for sure who, probably the assassin, assuming there was no one else in hiding. As for why, isn't it obvious? A trap. To you in the Seekers. She bit her lip. Targeting those who ensure the future of the Order, that's so horrible. If whoever did this is expecting having to capture dozens of Jedi. We should be prepared for heavy opposition. Our only advantage is that they do not expect the two of us. Isn't that more like a disadvantage, though? Capturing the Jedi would be messy, too risky. It would be more efficient to gather them in one spot and then wipe them out with something along the lines of an orbital strike. Zaya Thris analyzed, her cold tone giving no indication that she might be invested in the Seeker's fates. Requires them to be oblivious to the danger they're in. If that is the plan, we can warn the Seekers since we are aware of the plot. If whoever is behind this wants them alive, we will need to improvise. Sometimes you scare me a bit. They dropped out of hyperspace, the orange hues of Ossus filling the viewport. There appears to have been a major battle here recently. Wasn't the planet destroyed ages ago by Agar Khan? Zaya Thris inquired, bewildered by the debris orbiting the planet. The whole sector was, we actually discussed that recently in history class. Is that common knowledge? No idea, but I am vaguely from this part of the galaxy. Estran Sector. She idly wondered what the Imperial worlds looked like nowadays, whether there was anything left of the tombs on Koriban and whether Zeist had been resettled at some point. Or perhaps a full-scale Republic invasion had reduced everything to rubble and ash to make sure the Empire would never rise again. Oh, I have a clan mate from Ord Radamar. She tuned out as Katani proceeded to regale her with the boy's life story. Well, at least she had taken the Padawan's mind off the unpleasant events from earlier. Did you know that almost none of the ghosts of the ancient Sith Lords endorsed Vitiate, whereas they did support Igar Khan? Vitiate even had many of their tombs sealed or outright destroyed during his ascent to power. That's quite telling. Perhaps they were prescient of his plans. Do you draw legitimacy for your own ambitions from that fact? Huh. How so? Well, you have a rather unique relationship with ghosts and they seem to give you their approval. I think you are overestimating their goodwill. You didn't have to endure their rabid monologues and derogatory remarks all day and night. Instead, I have to listen to your complaints and crazy ideas, but I admit, you're a rather civil ghost, it could be worse. Like, vitiate level worse. Actually, I am not a ghost. Nox deadpanned. Okay, I'll play along, what are you, then? An intact spirit, at least I hope so. Does a holocron gatekeeper know he's not a real, whole entity? It's a bizarre conundrum. I am afraid you've lost me here. The difference lies in the fact that a ghost is a part of someone's essence, 
it has lost its original force tether and thus is dependent on either latching onto a vessel or attaching to objects or places, drawing its energy from, for example, the emotional echoes defining a tomb or battlefield, or the dark side imbued in an artifact. Halfway into the void. Able to linger in the physical world thanks to nothing but their tenacious refusal to let go of life, no matter how wretched their existence has become. You might have noticed that most Sith ghosts are somewhat single-minded. Because they only have their hatred or anger to sustain themselves. A spirit retains its conscience and autonomous connection to the Force, it just becomes incorporeal. The Jedi claim that a Sith cannot reach that state, something about only the light side allowing the soul to draw sustenance from the eternal conscience. Your. It's really nonsensical. I dearly hope I am proving them dead wrong. He allowed himself a private chuckle. I am not even sure about Vitiate, he still seemed to require a vessel, or multiple ones, though he was able to act quite independently at the same time. But you exist through me, too. Yeah, because I don't know how to detach my spirit from yours without detrimental effects remember, I wasn't going for this particular outcome, I just did what I could to salvage the situation when the throne thwarted my attempts of transferring your essence. In theory, it should be possible to disentangle our essences again. That's also why, unlike ghosts, I can't manifest myself on the spirit plane for you to see me through the force. I guess Vitiate never managed to figure it all out or he would have jumped ship before I ended him. That aspect kind of has me worried, though it might simply have been hubris on his part. Theoretically, I could just, ah, uh, uproot myself and kill you in the process, however, I needn't have gone through the whole ordeal of waiting for you to be woken from stasis if that was my intention. A good sign, however, is that when you use my powers, it's not because you feed on my essence but because you can access my force connection directly it's a bit like holding hands instead of cannibalism. What an apt comparison. Ah, uh, I did not need that image. You really have a way with words, Nox. Which part has you vexed so, the holding hands? We've done other, more intimate things together, my dear Ro. I am not prone to forget. We have with the bored horniness of adolescence. This current constellation however is singularly intimate, don't you think? In any case, I am exceedingly curious as to what the ancient ghosts would have to say about the prospect of an Emperor Sidious. Won't matter if we get to the point where we pull the strings. Our options for achieving this in a smooth way are getting more limited by the day. Well, unless he plans to devour the galaxy or something, we can act even after Sidious' plan has come to fruition. Just means a lot more collateral. It's too risky. It would probably result in the demise of most, if not all, Jedi and trillions of non-humans. And you care because. If he has any skill in feeding on death, that would only serve to strengthen him, immensely. We have no idea how powerful he actually is. That the rule of two has weakened the Sith is only conjecture, after all. You aren't an adherent of the concept of Sinosure. That the Force pours itself into those who wield it according to their allegiance and thus the Dark would concentrate in the few Sith left. That's certainly what Bane believed the Master to embody power and so on. If you want to keep it purely academic, no, I think the doctrine of natural continuum approach is far more in line with how the universe presents itself to us. Generally speaking, I don't give a bloody criff what the Force does on a galactic scale as long as it obeys me when I use it. My point is, I am not completely convinced that a part of Vitiate has not survived somehow and is lying dormant to reap the spoils in the end. That, jerk, 
was insanely patient and had a penchant for convoluted plots comprising of setting someone up as the ultimate champion, only to overtake their body eventually. There would be a certain poetic beauty in that scenario. It would be an absolute cluster, freak, that's what. As expected, there was no obvious enemy presence on Beldero, but navigating to the coordinates Mamun had provided under duress or rather, which ransacking his failing mind had yielded, brought them to what looked like a cluster of factories. Some of them were active, emitting steam from wide chimneys. In contrast, the ones farthest from the local settlements appeared deserted from above, while a cursory scan revealed several scattered groups of energy signatures. They landed unimpeded and took care to exit their ship without being seen not that their arrival would have gone unnoticed per se, yet it seemed wise to keep their enemies guessing. It did not take long for them to spot a lone droid patrol unit, which they ended up following cautiously. When the droids turned into a hallway leading to a large open area, Xyathris and the Padawan opted to crawl through the vents instead until they reached a dead end, a large filtration unit above one of the factory floors. It was from that unique vantage point, with only several layers of metallic mesh separating them from their enemies, that they were able to spy on the final exchanges in a conversation between a bizarre droid with a skull-like Kalish mask for a face and the hologram of a cloaked figure. That's General Grievous. The Supreme Commander of the Separatist Army. Katuni whispered into Xyathrysia. The sharp look her companion gave her in return silenced her immediately. Of the plan. I have already killed the eight Jedi that were foolish enough to come here, my lord. Grievous wheezed boastfully why would a machine have respiratory problems? Judging from the voice and stature alone, his interlocutor giving his superficial congratulations was clearly not tyrannous, so unless the form of address used was unusually widespread, that could mean only one thing. Xyathris suspicions were subsequently confirmed when the large creature continued briefing his superior on his progress. Lord Sidious, there is the matter of Kenobi and the other one. What would you have me do with them? The Padawan clapped her hands over her mouth. The clanking steps of a unit of commando droids taking position just outside of the room rendered the Sith Lord's reply inaudible. It will be done, my lord. Grievous bowed deferentially before the hologram winked out. Breathing rattling, he stalked out of the room, the droids following in his wake. We are too late. Katuni stated when they could not be overheard anymore, sorrow and fear welling up in her unequal parts. Her mind racing, it did not occur to Xyathris to give the Padawan a few soothing words. Tyrannus had sent her into a plot actually orchestrated by his master. Since it was unlikely to result in a confrontation with Sidious himself, the most benign interpretation that he intended for her to kill the Darth a little prematurely was off the table. So was her earlier conjecture that Sidious had laid a trap for his apprentice, finally dangling the elusive holocron before him there simply was not a trace of the repository of knowledge and Tyrannus had to be aware of grievous presence here. Then again, there was no connection between herself and the Jedi indicating that the plot had been in motion regardless of her involvement. Was she supposed to stop Sidious' plan? Why not tell her directly, then? What was she supposed to find? Whatever Tyrannus intended to use her for, it would be absurd to assume she would still be willing to aid him after embarking on a futile quest under such a ludicrous pretense. Certainly, given the circumstances, the holocron should have been a ruse but according to Maman, the shadow had been on the hunt for an alleged Sith holocron, albeit without success. She had not sensed a lie from Tyrannus at any point, either. Having played both sides and avoiding being identified by the Jedi for such a long time, he had to be an accomplished liar, but this level of deception was unsettling. 
His refusal to reveal the identity of his master certainly made sense in that context it was not an issue of trust rather than outright treachery. Even if Tyrannus had believed his story to be a sham, there was little doubt that his eventual fate would be the one he had described tossed away as soon as Sidious had reached his goals. Failing to commit to the alliance had doomed him, rendered him useless to both Sidious and the Roth. The elderly man might be fairly naive in his idealism, but neither thoughtless nor rash he would not simply reject the unique opportunity allying with her presented, unless Sidious offered something seemingly better. A chance to prove himself beyond the shadow of a doubt, perhaps. Delivering a potential enemy or tool of her caliber into his master's hands would be no small feat. Either way, Sidious was now aware of her thanks to Tyrannus Sidious or he would learn about her no matter how she proceeded from here, even if the Sith apprentice had not betrayed her after all. Refusing to play along would make Tyrannus assume that she had turned on him instead and send him running to his master. Thwarting this operation, however, would reveal her knowledge of either the Holocron or Tyrannus himself. Gone was another option for unmasking Sidious. The alternative was much less convenient, nevertheless she almost looked forward to the prospect it was going to a challenge. While it played into her hands, the involvement of Kenobi made the whole situation even more peculiar, he had no actual reason to be anywhere near Beldero. According to the news reports, he acted as one of the most celebrated generals of the Republic Army, which would make him a warrior, despite his moniker the Negotiator, which Xyathris supposed was an allusion to the kind of diplomacy Katani had joked about earlier. He would not be required to act upon Niquano's transmission in the first place and probably could not, anyway, with countless skirmishes in the Outer Rim swallowing up the Republic's resources. Xyathris snapped out of her thoughts at the sound of the Padawan's muffled sobbing. Get yourself together, all is not lost yet. The terminal in the corner of the room, can you access it? The girl sniffed a few times before responding, reeling emotionally from the sudden harshness of her companion. I guess I can try slicing into the system, but if they catch us. She wiped her puffy, red-rimmed eyes. We stand no chance against him. That remains to be seen. Grievous is not really a droid, isn't he? No, he is some kind of cyborg. And a notorious Jedi killer. Even Master Kenobi has faced him before and failed to bring him to justice. That's some impressive cybernetics for sure. Well, he fits right in with those under his command. Any known weaknesses? I don't think anyone has had an actual chance to find out. So many Jedi have fallen to his blade during the war, even accomplished masters. People say he keeps their lightsabers as trophies. Must have accumulated quite a collection then. Xyathris replied with a snort. That certainly was in keeping with the, dang, lizard's customs and Grievous had to be one of the more insane, or disparate, ones, to opt for such extensive augmentation. A cranial implant or prosthetic limb was one thing, but to replace one's whole body. Some of her contemporaries had undergone similar procedures, rendering them more machine than flesh and bones. She considered it a great folly no cybernetic boosts could surpass true mastery of the Force, and in her experience, those heavily modified had trouble accessing the Force as well as before, ultimately rendering them weaker. The good news is that if their lackey is here to do the dirty work, the Sith are unlikely to be around. If they were, we'd be dead already. The power of inciting fear in one's adversaries. Sidious would emerge victorious without needing to lift a single digit. Xyathris spat derisively. Jedi can be killed if you know how, same goes for Sith. Unlike Pierce, she had not kept a kill count, so all bets were off, 
but it was entirely possible that she'd bested as many of her peers as she had slain Jedi. Katumi's eyes narrowed in suspicion at that callous statement. And do you, know how? Zyathris gave her a wry smile. Practically or academically? Um, just assume I never asked. Don't worry, little Padawan, you are unlikely to find out firsthand. The droids are well gone, let's find out what's going on. Having pried the security hatch open with the help of Katuni's saber, they dropped into the room beneath them soundlessly. After a few minutes, the holo terminal activated itself to display the CIS logo as a welcome message, signaling the Padawan's success. Good work. Bring up the recent recordings. A selection of previews popped up above the table. Even the miniaturized moving images showed the last moments of several Jedi in gory detail. Most appeared to have died in an enclosed, arena-like place. Perhaps one of the inactive furnaces. Grievous skills with a lightsaber were quite impressive for someone unable to use the force few would be able to defeat an opponent wielding four sabers at once that spun with astounding velocity. Katuni averted her eyes, horrified. Don't look away, it won't make it less real. What do you feel? It's so unfair. They weren't even combatants. They never faced the separatists directly they were targeted for being Jedi. Being seekers, they must have been some of the kindest, most empathic souls of the whole order, since they interact with the potential initiates and their parents. It should not come as a surprise to you that, given the chance, Sidious would not hesitate to murder every single Jedi, including infants in their cribs and younglings, regardless of their innocence. I know. I just can't believe someone can be that cruel and, I know it really shouldn't, it makes me so angry. I hate those Sith for being evil. I mean, bounty hunters or pirates aren't good people, either, but the corruption and malice of the Sith has no bounds. In their deliberate depravity, they have forfeited their right to live. A natural reaction to a threat you feel helpless against. However, isn't the goal to bring them to trial, not to kill them? I guess so, but they would not afford us any mercy either. And they are too dangerous to be imprisoned. It's not like I want anyone dead. Your teachings discourage hatred and such emotions, yes. Feeling them regardless must cause you no small amount of guilt. Such weakness will be your downfall. If you want to stay alive, you must gain clarity of purpose. What drives you is up to you, but you cannot allow for doubt. Katuni's open-mouthed stare caused the former Roth to sigh. She will get it eventually. She did not necessarily intend to turn the young girl to the dark side, such an inexperienced apprentice would be both a distraction and a liability. Besides, with Katuni posing no threat to her, she had nothing to gain from making her fall just for the sake of it. As fun as messing with the minds of Jedi was, the Padawan possessed an inner strength and wisdom for her age that Zyathris could respect. Given the right tools and an alternative perspective, she might be able to remove some of her chains, increasing her chances of surviving whatever Sidious had in mind for the Jedi Order. I wonder, if the Force is with you and all that, how a pair of Sith can be so infinitely superior that the whole order is left floundering. But let's discuss this in a safer environment. Try to find out what Kenobi is doing here and where he is. Zyathris browsed the databanks, rummaging through the military records for further clues of what the Separatists' next moves could entail. Most data was classified and thus, inaccessible to her, with the exception of low-importance information like material lists, requisition orders, the boring bureaucracy of war. An entry caught her attention. Foreigners too. She had no particular reason to assume there was a link to the proceedings on Belderone. Yet, 
it was where it all started, for her at least. One request for four autonomous, top-of-the-line Vector tanks had been added at a later date. A peculiar demand for a droid battalion, which might have a single sentient commanding officer at the most, and an even more peculiar number. Knox. Tell me that this is a coincidence. Uncharacteristically, he remained silent. Knox. Care to shed some light on this? Quietly, almost sheepishly, he replied after some palpable hesitation. So, I guess I owe you an explanation, anger exploded in her chest at his veiled admission. Zyathris, snap out of it. You are going to harm us both. A hint of desperation crept into his appeal. Make it quick, or I might simply not care. Look, they were gone when you woke up. I assumed they hadn't survived and did not pursue the issue. You never criffing asked. He was right, she had preferred to bury the memories instead, fearing that dwelling on the possible fate of her companions would create a wound rather than fan the flames of her ire. Still, you had no right to keep this from me. I was in no position to do anything while we were still on Farinus and afterwards, think about it, if they had made it, Tyrannus would have used them against you, either as incentive or threat, wouldn't he? There was no time to bring it up after the talk with him, and well, here we are. They are dead. Period. If you are still questioning my motives, has it occurred to you that I would have been prepared to set worlds ablaze if I thought there was even the slightest chance of getting Theron back? Her blood pounded in her ears, providing the rhythm to her vengeful train of thoughts. Make them pay. I think I have located Master Kenobi. The Padawan's voice cut through the crimson fog in her mind. I don't have a visual on him, but the majority of the droids and Grievous are converging on that position. Seeing the woman hold onto the control panel for support, she asked with honest concern, what's wrong? Zyathris had not noticed that she had closed her eyes. Not trusting her usual meditation technique to have the desired effect of erasing all traces of her inner turmoil, she kept them shut while she tried to get the involuntary trembling under control. She forced a casual tone into her reply. Nothing. Go back the way we came and either hide near the ship if the separatists have not locked it down already or procure another vessel for us to get off planet. In any case, do not let them find you. Ah, okay, but, wait a second. There is something you might want to see. The Tholotheum projected a map over the Holotable. These are all the factories under grievous control here on Beldero. See these lines over there. They are the conduits used for transporting certain raw materials. They all have coolant pipes running alongside them. And we crawled past the sum of the tanks. This facility is inactive, but all the stuff is still here, as if they merely shut it down temporarily. Zyathris hummed in agreement with the girl's assessment. Volatile components, it seems. And those dots. I pulled this schematic from the stack of orders given to the droids. The placement at junctions and depots, I mean, it's suspicious, isn't it? More than that. Those are the best locations for maximizing the effect of explosives. Dang. Well, this changes little, except for the urgency. You have your orders. What about you? I have a score to settle. Stand by for my signal. Ironically, the fact that she no longer flew under the radar of the Banit Sith constituted the only bright spot in all of this. She did not need to hold back anymore. Another Sith appearing on the scene in these dire times would give the Jedi a collective heart attack. Perhaps it would shock them into going along with her plan Besh. Let's play. Beyond question, he was no stranger to missions turning out far more complicated than necessary. 
that would be in blatant understatement for the current situation. He was supposed to rescue them, not get backed into a corner, reduced to watching as Grievous made a show of dealing the death blow to one of the Jedi captured earlier. The knight had been marked for death already, as evidenced by the extensive injuries stemming from torture, and was carried in ostensibly just to make General Kenobi a witness of his execution. A trap like this, as insidiously engineered as it had been, should not be enough to lure in roughly half of their seekers and even catch two experienced Jedi generals off guard. They really should be better than that. As if to taunt him about his failure, the Zabrik Knight's empty eyes stared up at him from the floor, where the murdered Jedi's head lay, several meters from his contorted body. Now, only his fellow master and frequent comrade in arms during the earliest days of the war, Illuminara Unduli, was left. He expected to be able to keep defending himself for quite a bit longer, even as worn out as he was but going on the offensive was unthinkable. The Magna Guards prevented him from reaching the Myri Allen imprisoned in an energy field, shackled hands raised above her head keeping her upright. Getting out of this situation should have been easier. Yet, months of constant conflict had taken their toll. It was only now that Obi-Wan came to realize how the relentless flow of battle had shaped him over the years turned him into a blunt instrument of war. What he was attuned to nowadays was not the pure wellspring of the Force, not the gentle call of its will, but something far more primal altogether. A sinister drum of destruction he was marching to in the name of peace. And truly, it was in name only. The Force didn't even warn them properly anymore, as if they were beyond its reach. Beyond saving. Ironic that he would to come so close to death, to utter defeat, to comprehend these glaring, mortifying truths. This was how he had got into his current predicament. One instant of inattention, one millisecond of hesitation, and Grievous brought one of his arms down in a strike that Obi-Wan instinctively knew he would physically be unable to parry or dodge fully. He closed the distance between them instead of futilely evading it, causing his hand to be hit by the cyborg's arm rather than the green lysabrous blade the commander had taken from Illuminara. As expected, the Jedi's weapon was knocked from his hands. What happened then in the blink of an eye was the real mistake, inadvertently giving Grievous an opening to clasp the front plate of his battle-worn armor and toss him into the wall like a discarded toy. His vision was swimming and tinged red at the edges, but he retained consciousness, though barely. Grievous' personal droid guard was on him immediately. The Council had been made aware of irregular proceedings with regards to the members of the Sentinel Division scouting for Force-sensitive children several days earlier. Illuminara, happening to be near the last known position of one of the missing Seekers, volunteered to investigate. The dead Zabrik had been one of her clanmates, Obi-Wan recalled, perhaps she'd personal reasons for doing so. It seemed like misguided heroism now, like so many acts these days. They had lost contact with her as well soon after. Additionally, rumors of the separatists relocating a part of their operations to the Aurel sector had been backed up by new intel coming through the Chancellor's office. Obi-Wan had subsequently been pulled away from battle, leaving his 212th in Cody's hands to fight without the support of their general. A tiny part of him had been looking forward to finally ending the terror wrought by Grievous. Now, though, it felt strange, like being in the right place at the wrong time, that he faced the separatist leader on his own. Especially considering how things had gone awfully downhill. Somehow, his troops had become such an essential part of his life, of his soul even, that he had not assumed he would die alone, dozens of Parsecs separating him and the clones under his command. He had not even taken the time to bide Cody farewell. Not that such sentimentality served a purpose in the grand scheme of things, but... 
As always, the mental anguish was worse than the physical. He wondered when he had resigned himself to expecting to die today. Grievous sent another jolt of energy through Luminera, eliciting only a quiet whimper in contrast to her tortured screams before. Blood pounding in his ears, Obi-Wan did not even register the cyborg's jeering insults and goading to get him to make another mistake in the attempt to save her. Tiredly batting the droid's onslaught of attacks aside with the Electra staff he had wrenched away from one of them, he nevertheless tried to get closer to the contraption holding his fellow Jedi, to be able to at least deactivate it to give Illuminara a chance to escape. Fighting at such close quarters left him little maneuvering room and much room for carelessness. A sharp pain blossomed in his back and spread out, causing him to convulse in pain with no control over his muscles. If Grievous entered the fight it would be over soon, and not in the Jedi's favor. He willed himself to reflect on his options constructively, but the thoughts lacked coherence, his synapses on fire. His resilience was wearing thin. Another attack he failed to dodge. The electricity was now in his head, a veritable thunderstorm raging in his field of vision. He could almost taste the ozone. The light continued to become brighter, unbearably so, until it engulfed the whole room. It bounced from the walls, creating a mesh of blue lightning strikes overhead that struck the floor where two flashes intersected. A shadow emerged from the blinding light, and the air was knocked from Kenobi's chest as he dropped to one knee. The figure held her hands out to the side, the air blurring around them. The lightning was taking shape over the palms, becoming fully formed above her head and proceeded to rain down on the droids. The standard clankers posted near the entrance were reduced to a shriveled heap of metal. The more advanced droids, fortified against electromagnetic pulses, were temporarily stunned while their shields dissipated the energy and directed the overcurrent to ground. The lighting abated abruptly. Only the haphazardly twitching Magna Guards and Grievous were left standing. With a bored grimace, the figure kicked a staff up and in one fluid motion spun her body around, destroying the remaining droids with a rapid succession of precise japs piercing their chest armor. She came to stand in front of the commander of the Separatist forces and looked up to him, a defiant smirk spreading across her face. Obi-Wan could not have ruled out that with his pain-addled mind he wasn't just seeing things, he certainly wished it wasn't real, but, truth be told, there was little doubt. As incredibly insane as that truth was. Longer hair bundled up in a disheveled knot and her black uniform-like attire enhanced with rudimentary armor, reinforced fan braces and extravagant knee-high boots. He barely recognized the woman who had unexpectedly joined the battle in the Sundry Palace and saved Satin's life. The most disturbing feature, however, was the color of her irises, which had taken on a yellow-orange hue, iridescent like durasteel alloy heated beyond the point of crystallization. A canvas of dark shadows around her eyes and faint lines branching like veins across her temples gave them an otherworldly glow. A sense of duty surged in his chest, a visceral, automatic reaction compelling him to attempt to end the threat she represented. The feeling did not translate into action. His limbs felt unnaturally heavy, the woman's sheer presence rendered him unable to move. She did not exude the tightly wound control of Dooku nor the unhinged erraticness of Maul, yet her presence carried enormous weight and authority daring one to oppose and suffer the consequences. The seemingly still intact saber of another seeker tortured to death, whose name eluded Obi-Wan, lay partially obscured beneath the electrocuted droid. If he used this brief moment of distraction to call it into. Promptly, the lightsaber in question jerked a few times, almost awkwardly attempting to disobey the command, and flew into the woman's hand. I hope you're worth all the fuss, General Grievous. Her voice was huskier, 
darker than he remembered, sending a chill through his bones. While Grievous split his arms, igniting four sabers from his collection, her eyes locked with Obi-Wan's, a deep, penetrating look as if to challenge him. To make sure he watched her every move. Two of her adversary's hands were gone even before Obi-Wan had analyzed her stance. A lesser opponent without the cyborg's enhanced reflexes, even the average Jedi, if Obi-Wan was honest, would have been gutted before he could have so much as realized there was an incoming attack requiring a reaction to begin with. Afterwards, it became blatantly obvious that she toyed with the separatist leader, dragging out an uneven fight to showcase her superiority. She danced around him with a flurry of quick and precise attacks that on the surface had no pattern to them, but there were some similarities in which openings she tended to exploit, in how she guided her opponent into a weaker position, to Maul's style. She appeared to be used to dual wielding, only the ferocity of the insanely fast-paced battle causing her to occasionally revert to classic two-handed DJEM so movements whenever she was required, in her playful restraint, to react instead of pressing the offense. Deadly efficient and merciless, even her saber technique betrayed her allegiance. Watching the confrontation with a growing sense of dread, Obi-Wan remained mystified as to why a Sith would assault Grievous, were they not supposed to be on the same side? Not to mention the instances reported when the stranger had directly, and rather openly, aided the Republic war effort, thus risking exposure. Following this train of thought to its logical conclusion, it was all his fault, all the deaths caused by the Sith of the past months his responsibility, for he had not sensed her true nature earlier. How could he miss something fundamental like that? It was one thing to shield oneself, but to hold back to such an extent even while fighting. During the brief battle with Maul and his brother, it was obvious that she was not untrained, but her style had been more generic, the kind taught by various military organizations that still employed melee weapons. His assumption, or rather, Satin's, had been that she had a Mandalorian background, possibly from the rumored groups of Mandalorians in the diaspora of Wild Space. It would have explained her desire to act at such a decisive moment which would alter the fate of Mandalore, and the fact that she had seemingly reacted to conversations of the Death Watch held in Mandalay when she handed the Duchess over to her sister. Tyrannus was still active, and in the past, acolytes like Ventress had been available to do the dirty work for the Separatists. There was absolutely no need for the second Sith to involve herself directly now. What had changed? Had Dooku fallen out of grace, or even been killed while he was stuck here? Was Grievous to be punished? But in that case, would she not deal with the Jedi present first? How could this hitherto completely unknown woman have pulled the strings of the Republic for years and corrupted it so thoroughly? Grievous ostensibly gained the upper hand for a moment, allowing him to slice through his opponent's saber and hold her in his vice-like grip, pressed against his upper body. She thrashed against him only cursorily, before going still. A rippling scream erupted from her, sending both warriors hurtling quite some distance apart. Grievous' metal clawed feet dug into the ground, bringing him to a stop. On the other side of the room, the woman rose with a kind of languid grace and rolled her shoulders experimentally, face alight with the excitement of battle. A grim determination settled on her features. She raised her hands and pushed them apart slowly. At first, this seemed to have no effect on the cyborg charging towards her, but then he abruptly stopped, clawing at his chest, the armor of which came apart revealing the organs beneath it. Howling with rage and humiliation he made to pounce. He did not come any further. The contents of his synth skin gut sack spilled on the floor. The Sith lifted his still pulsating heart up with the force, dangled it before the cyborg's face and summarily crushed it.
She wiped the droplets of blood and machine oil from her cheeks and knelt to pry the last functioning saber from Grievous' clenched fist. She stalked over to Obi-Wan. So that was how he would die, cut down by his own weapon, after having witnessed the return of the Sith in full. She stood above him and raised the saber in a vague, deliberately sloppy saucy ready stance. He expected a taunt. A smug monologue of triumph. A final malicious commentary on the weakness of the light side or something along that vein. I guess you lost something. Her eyes snapped down to his face, her intent unreadable. By the way, I cannot help but notice a running theme here, is getting into hopeless situations part of your usual repertoire, an act to downplay your skill. No, it appears to be testament to my latent masochism, if anything. The Jedi quipped, the steadiness of his voice a surprise even to himself. That would explain a lot. He held her scrutinizing gaze, waiting how their confrontation would play out. Something the matter, Master Kenobi. You look as if you had seen a ghost. Without waiting for a reply or even looking towards her target, the woman threw the saber into the direction of Uminera. The lit blade cut through the field generator, deactivating the device, and the weapon returned, spinning in a wide arc. The Myri Allen Jedi dropped to the ground, hunched over. The Sith held out her hand in invitation. Warily, Obi-Wan clasped her forearm and allowed himself to be pulled into a standing position. Get moving, both of you, places rigged to blow up. I'd be surprised if that piece of scum hasn't activated the countdown somehow. The whole situation still failed to make any sense to him, but compliance might improve their chances of survival, or at the very least, of informing the Council of what had transpired. His heart sank when he noticed that she had clipped his saber back to its place on his utility belt. If it was of no concern to her that her enemy was armed. Without sparing him another glance, the Sith walked towards the entrance and spoke into a communicator. Illumina Renelde curled up on herself, robes ripped apart in places, and looked up at her fellow Jedi with unfocused eyes not registering the gravity of the situation. That her torture was finally over, but something far more terrible had emerged from the shadows. Blood was trickling from her nose, intermingling with the cold sweat on her face. When she slung her arm over his shoulder for support, he felt her shivering. They headed towards the doorway, both swaying with exertion as they walked. Suddenly, the Sith was beside them again, wordlessly holding out a large piece of dark brown cloth ripped off the clothes of the dead Jedi on the floor, her face unreadable. Belatedly realizing her surprisingly benevolent intent, he draped it over Luminara's bare head. Following a Sith, even supposedly to safety, the accuracy of this turn was debatable, ranked high on the list of the most foolish choices he had made in his life. It was not a particularly long list, but then again, the entries were carefully curated. A unit of droids opened fire at them, appearing out of nowhere. A flash of lightning, and they dropped to the ground, circuits smoking. Limitless power. The Sith deadpanned upon seeing Obi-Wan's aghast expression. You should try it sometime. Her features twisted into something like veiled vicious eagerness as she added more quietly, as if to herself. You just got to ask. The flames of the massive blaze that raised the factory complex to the ground grazed the underside of the ship as they took off. Too bloody close for comfort. Like the blue blade hovering centimeters from her neck. Back still exposed to her attacker, Xyathris lifted her hands to the side, fingers splayed in what she believed was a vaguely peaceful gesture. Intending to strike down an unarmed opponent. I expected better of you, Jedi Master. One is never unarmed with the Force. And we have seen your powers. 
you flaunted them in all their violent ugliness. The female Jedi hissed. Well, there is that. Though I beg to differ about that last part your sense of beauty is rather defective. She turned around slowly, taking care to stay clear of the slightly quivering saber. A flick of the wrist is all it takes. She taunted the Myri Allen, who did not move. Eyes lighting up, the Sith bared her teeth in an almost feral smile. Oh, you can't. How peculiar. Perhaps the treatment you suffered at grievous hands has taken too much of a toll. You should rest instead of making an enemy of me. The Sith already are the enemy, no effort on our part required. Kenobi, who had not intervened when his fellow Jedi took his saber without his consent, joined the discussion, his dumbfounded look reluctantly morphing into one of resolve. Ha! Huh. You disappoint me I expected a more nuanced argument from a Jedi. Last time I checked, there was not even a law against being a Sith. I am sure the legislators of the Republic would frown upon adherents of two religious orders clashing violently deadly, even over doctrinal issues. You inciting a war and murdering billions of innocents is hardly a doctrinal issue. Kenobi cut in. Zaya Thris cocked her head, her expression softening to a degree. Ah, I thought you oblivious to the details. So you know about the rule of two. We do. And you lie snarled. You can drop the deception, Sidious. The Sith sighed dramatically and took a few measured steps towards her. Your unwarranted hostility is beginning to make sense now. It's all a tragic misunderstanding, really. Unable to defend herself, the Myri Allen pressed her back against the wall. Her breathing hitched. The taller woman leaning over her was now close enough that the Jedi could see the faint streaks of crimson in the amber irises, gleaming like dying embers. Splendid deductive reasoning, but your premise is faulty. You see, I am not Darth Sidious. In fact, I am not even part of his pathetic lineage. I want him dead as much as you do. Probably more, since I actually have emotions and desires. She grasped Unduli's wrist, bending her hand backwards until she was forced to drop the weapon. It clattered to the floor uselessly. She recovered pretty fast. Oh, she is in a lot of pain. It's just her fear that keeps her going at this point. The disorientation earlier probably wasn't just from the torture, though. Shouldn't have allowed her to cover up if you wanted to keep her a bit more weakened. Why would that be of consequence? I thought it was a cultural thing. Actually, no. They didn't include xenobiology in the imperial curriculum, did they? Not that I can remember. No, just pure blood and human anatomy. Add to that a couple of grotesque comparisons intended to prove the superior genetic heritage of Imperials and you get complete cluelessness in the average citizen. On one occasion, Quinn accidentally gave Vet a huge overdose of painkillers because he'd failed to take into account the substance accumulating in the lecky rather than her liver processing it. She was zoned out for days suffered minor psychotic breaks for weeks and was cross with him for even longer. When there was explicit mention of aliens during my education, it was to subtly fuel the rumors circulating, for example that they have crazy genitals with barbs, tentacles or highly acidic fluids to discourage fraternization with other species. Ha, huh, those might actually exist, though. Growing up in slave quarters with little privacy, you see all kinds of nether parts. Ahem, to answer your question, Myrielans have an extrasensory organ on their scalp. The expression of it varies between individuals, and it's more sensitive in females, which is why they usually cover their heads. As a Jedi she'd be able to deal with the effects easily, but in her weakened state. Is that why you'd always wear a hood after Koriban? 
but it didn't seem like you needed it, even when you were still rather new to using the force. No, that was to hide the collar scar. Being addressed as slave got annoying really quickly, and I couldn't kill everyone doing so on the spot, for various unfortunate reasons. So, let's just say slave owners can't be bothered by needs like head covering. Too much hassle. Thus, they simply forego it, have you suffer disorientation and headaches for a couple of weeks and be done with it. Permanently. It shrivels up. Of course. I shouldn't be surprised. If you think that's cruel, you should have seen what happened to members of species requiring a certain amount of moisture or trimming of their fur. One kid in my group had some kind of woolly fur, no idea what species he was, but they sheared half his ass off in an attempt to get rid of the excessive hairiness. Or, for a less unique example, ask the Chilek if they are happy with being everyone's simpering, compliant, freak, toy. The Jedi took her explanation with little composure. That's impossible. Kenobi gasped, horrified. I am pretty sure that's exactly what your ancestors said when they found out that the Sith Order had endured. The Sith stepped back from her victim and turned towards the second Jedi as he spoke. It's what we said when a Sith named Darth Maul appeared almost two decades ago and killed my master. Kenobi was fishing for a reaction from her. So Maul preceded Tyranus. Strange for a discarded apprentice to survive. Well, he probably has been dealt with. My condolences. The male Jedi's eyebrow went up in disbelief. You really were not aware before. No, because we thought your kind extinct. You should know this. If you don't mind me asking, why are we having this conversation? So polite. She snorted wryly. Because it beats mindless bloodshed. Should that not be in alignment with Jedi beliefs? I mean, I am fine with gutting both of you, but it would not be my preferred choice of action at the moment. Besides, if you're reaching for a duel, you should regain your full strength first. Right now, you wouldn't last longer than a few heartbeats, occasionally impressive Sorsu notwithstanding. And what a waste that would be. Kenobi gulped her intense gaze making him uncomfortable, but apparently decided to let the illusions slide. What is it that you want, then? To help the Jedi prevail against Sidious. Help us. Why would a Sith wish to see us emerge victorious against your own kind? Well, the enemy of my enemy is an effective and most importantly, willing tool I need not have any qualms about sacrificing. But should you not be in support of his goals? The Myri Allen pressed. Or is this a personal vendetta? Far from it. In fact, my motivation is the least personal possible, I have nothing to gain or lose, regardless of whether Sidious wins. His ascent to ultimate power is bound to come about in a way that will eventually destroy more than the Jedi or the Republic government. You haven't seen what horror and indiscriminate destruction such power, if unchecked, may wreak. And you have. Kenobi asked, voice dripping with incredulity. Yes. Which is why I cannot allow him to bring his plans to fruition. The doors to cockpit slid open and Katuni peeked out. I changed our ship's ID, so that we don't get shot down as soon as we enter Republic space, and set course for Coruscant. Communication is a little tricky, but should be up in an hour, give or take. If you need medical attention sooner, I suggest we. The Padawan trailed off as she took in the situation. What is happening? Masters. Her eyes darted between Xyathris' placating pose and the desperate expressions of her fellow Jedi. Introductions went less than stellar, Katuni. Xyathris explained, with a lopsided, mischievous smirk. 
the Jedi realized with shocked surprise who was piloting them. Aunt Yulai, now free to move again, eyed the saber on the floor, while Kenobi moved to stand protectively between Xyathris and the girl. As if. The latter spoke up with indignation. Masters, with all due respect, Triss took charge uncovering the deception and rescuing you. She was instrumental in thwarting the plot, if not for her. Kenobi and the other master exchanged a dejected look. Padawan, Katuni, is it? Whatever she has told you she has been using you. She is Sith. Katuni recoiled. I I don't understand. She has been nothing but supportive and helpful and... Oh. She looked at Xyathris as if seeing her properly for the first time. Explain. There was a sharpness to her voice that made the Sith smile inwardly. Contrary to what the Jedi tell themselves to sleep soundly at night, Sith are not monsters. I have not been manipulating you all this time. Done nothing to your master, if that's what you think. I have not lied to you once. Strategic missions aside. And what about Beldero? There were civilians down there. They can't all have been separatists. The other factories had local staff. You didn't even try to defuse the bombs. The Padawan blurted out before Undulai could respond. Xyathris rolled her eyes. And did you? I am no demolitions expert, and containing an explosion of that scale, well, that's not how the force works. Or maybe I just couldn't be bothered. Chalk it up to collateral. I am sure there is a column for that in Gar accounting. Ignoring the girl's disgusted face, she leaned casually against a wall and inspected her vambraces for damage. Look, you saw the data. The CIS was planning to relocate to Beldero. How many innocent locals would have got caught up in the crossfire of the Republic incursion? How many killed in an evacuation effort? A hundred, if not thousand times as many as could possibly have been working in the factories. Not to mention the clone soldiers falling in those battles. This is war, you make a choice and live with the consequences. But why would you choose to help us, if not for ulterior motives? Sith are selfish by their very nature this woman can't help it, can she? Don't pretend to understand the Sith. Bloody void, you people are practically begging for death. Not necessarily by my hands. She added mockingly, sensing the others surging fear. As Sith go, I am rather patient, if I say so myself. Where were we? Ah. We have established that I am not Sidious. And you expect us to take your word for that. Well, it's hard to prove something like that. Does it suffice that it would be incredibly nonsensical to save the two of you, kill Grievous, reveal myself in such a half-assed way and do all that other stuff I've done for the benefit of the Republic she shot Kenobi a meaningful look. And the Jedi, as Katuni can attest. If I, assuming I was Sidious, wanted to get on your good side, I'd surreptitiously feed you intel, make sure you win enough battles not to become suspicious about the Sith, the Banit ones, that is, playing both sides like Togroot and Shadow Puppets. And then cut the strings so everything collapses on itself. Not this undignified tomfoolery. So, if you're not in league with them, how did you become Sith? You're not telling us there is a second lineage that has survived until now. You know, I left that part out because it's actually the least believable aspect of the whole thing. Even to me, I have to admit. Is it? The most likely explanation is that you're fallen and have simply assumed the mantle of Sith to give your dabbling in the dark side more legitimacy. Hearing this purposely insulting theory caused Xyathris to laugh harshly. Oh, the irony. I really should make you suffer for your insolence. 
She took a deep breath that failed to dampen her involuntarily anger. I have slain two emperors and one treacherous contender, I dare say I have earned my title. If anything, Sidious and his ilk are the unworthy upstarts. Last time I checked, there was only a republic, with a chancellor in charge, and no emperors around anywhere. That smooth little, crap, Kenobi had the gall to mock her speech. Well, at least he isn't as demure as his code requires. Last time you checked probably wasn't close to 4,000 years ago. Stunned silence was the only reply. See, I told you so.